Hi, I am Alexander Hanin, the chairman and co-founder of Vision Labs. Dear speakers, dear participants, dear friends, I am so happy to welcome you to Machines Can See, the annual summit of comp on computer vision and deep learning. This is the first time Vision Labs organizes this event, and this year, for obvious reasons, we run it online. In Vision Labs, we feel dedicated to share the knowledge and to advance computer vision with, for everyone's benefit. We are particularly delighted to have top speakers of the field who will in the next three days share their latest research results from academia and industry. These results will soon become a basis for new products and services that will define our new reality of tomorrow. You hope you will enjoy the talks and the communication with the speakers on our platform. With this short introduction, I would like starting and hearing the talks. Yeah, I wanted to share a few words with you about the format of the summit. Uh, as Alexander said, so this is the fourth time we organize the summit and we usually run it uh, uh, physical meetings, of course. Um, so online meetings have their drawbacks, but uh, we actually believe also there are uh, advantages and we would like to take this opportunity to experiment with a few different formats. So uh, this summit will have uh, 12 talks uh, lined up in uh, three days, four talks each day. And um, so almost all the talks have been actually recorded. And uh, so this is for better image quality and for, to um, avoid any, uh, any connection problems. Uh, so this actually makes, uh, uh, offers an opportunity to, uh, to have more communication between the speakers and, uh, and you, the audience. So, uh, so below this window, uh, you see here two sections. So one is called uh, comments and another one is called questions. So uh, in the comment section, so feel free to talk and uh, ask speakers during their talk uh, if you wonder about something. And if speakers are available online, uh, most of them, they will be, uh, so they will answer your questions while the talk is running, because the talk is recorded. Also in the question section, you can uh, ask questions which will be then asked by moderator during discussion, which will happen after, at the end of the session and the end of the day, uh, where all speakers will connect live and uh, talk together with moderator and will answer the questions. Uh, so these are words about the uh, format, and now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Deva Ramanan. So Deva Ramanan is a senior computer vision scientist. So he is uh, actually one of the key people who, who is responsible for a big jump in uh, object detection, which happened about 10 years ago with uh, so-called uh, latent uh, SVM models, which by that time were the uh, revolutionized the field and made the performance really grow. So, and uh, for this, so uh, Deva has received uh, several awards. So he has been an IEEE PAMI Young Research Award in 2012. And he also received the Long Higgins Prize for fundamental contributions in computer vision in 2018. So Deva is associated professor in Robotics Institute at Carnegie uh, Mellon University. Uh, he has a double appointment in uh, Argo AI, where he leads a team working on autonomous driving. Uh, so computer vision has had lots of progress in recent years, and uh, the challenges uh, are also evolving. So uh, one of the new interesting challenge is uh, robotics, which combines perception, uh, which needs to combine both perception and uh, an action. And so Deva is one of the people who is taking this challenge. And today he will be talking to us about embodied perception in the wild. And unfortunately, Deva has some other commitments this morning. So or, yeah, he's in US, so for him this, this morning. 
And uh, so he, he won't be available online at the moment, but uh, you can still ask him questions and we will try to ask them during the discussion session, which will happen after all the talks. So thank you and welcome to Machine Can See. Hello, my name is uh, Dave Aramnan. I'm delighted to speak uh, at this conference, uh, this virtual conference, um, and I will be speaking about embodied perception for open world robotics. Um, I'm a professor at the Robotics Institute at, at Carnegie Mellon University, and this is joint work with a wonderful set of students and collaborators. Okay, so first, um, what do we mean by this title? Um, so in addition to my position as a, as a faculty member, I've been spending time as a principal scientist for, uh, for Argo AI, which is a self-driving um, startup. And I wanted to kind of motivate a bunch of questions in embodied perception in the wild through the lens of autonomous driving and see if I can kind of um, uh, convince you in the, in the virtual audience that this is a, an interesting place to think about computer vision. Um, and so from a, a vision point of view, um, you can think of an autonomous fleet of cars as high resolution sensors that are always operating and capturing um, continuous streams of the world. And so it's an exciting, I think, view of kind of a data stream that, that's always on. Um, and it's also uh, sort of intense in terms of the quantity of data that's being captured. Um, and maybe most, most um, sort of tangibly, um, thinking about vision in a in a, in a self-driving car allows you to think of the interplay between perception and action. And we'll talk about a bunch of things that arise from that. Um, and then finally, this is not, um, this is really true of um, the perception action link is really an example of uh, vision for robotics. Um, but I think what's unique about self-driving cars is that a lot of times, if you think of other robotics applications like manipulation, um, you're sort of forced to uh, do that in a lab setting, but uh, here, because you're actually autonomously moving, you go out in the real world and interact with very different kinds of scenarios. So I think from the um, kind of the, the data diversity point of view, it's an interesting place to think about in the wild perception. Um, okay, so I'll talk about a, a bunch of issues that I think are important in this space. Um, and then um, I'll just sort of dig, dig, dig right in to... Uh, uh, um, what we'll talk about here. Okay, so um, let's see here. So I, I want to motivate here. I want to motivate um, a lot of the questions by looking at the difficulties and the challenges in this space. So um, one of the um, you, you, unique things about doing something that here, where um, it's kind of very much in the public eye, is that um, when there are mistakes and um, uh, and difficulties that arise, um, accidents, um, they are very uh, intensely scrutinized. Um, so in this world of um, autonomous vehicles that are being deployed with safety drivers, um, clearly there's been challenges and, mis and accidents that have been happening. Um, and it's been very important to um, use that as a lens to kind of look at the, the mistakes of current systems and the inadequacies and try to sort of solve them. Um, and so here, of course, this is um, in incredibly um, um, challenging and also um, critical to, to sort of safe operation. So here I'm looking at a particular accident um, where um, tragically there was a, a, a person walking with a bicycle um, across the street um, and the, the, the vehicle collided. Um, and so the National Transportation Safety Board did a pretty in-depth analysis of what went wrong. And this is uh, sort of freely available. And I urge people to sort of look at this because it, it gives an eye into the complexity of the systems that are involved and the, the many places where safety is uh, implemented. Um, but from the, from the perspective of computer vision, I think what's super important is to think about, um, uh, there's a particular passage here that, uh, uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, the automatic driving system changed the pedestrian's classification several times, um, alternating between vehicle, bicycle, and other. And because the system never classified the pedestrian as such, um, the system design excluded tracking history for non-persisting objects, um, those with changed classifications. It was unable to correctly predict the pedestrian's path. Uh, so uh, let's see here. Um, the thing I wanted to stress here was that as the, the system was moving, uh, moving in front, um, uh, as the system was moving in front, 
um, it's actually very difficult to, uh, uh, let's see, it's, it's actually very difficult to come up with stable interpretations of a dynamic world. Um, so one way to think about this is you could imagine that uh, this almost, if you were to sort of look at this from a, from a vision point of view, this represents a flicker um, as frames come through the data stream of what the sensors are seeing. Um, you're running some vision system to analyze what's happening and interp interpret what's in the world. And those interpretations, if you do it on a per frame basis as they come in, um, if they change from one perspective, you might think, oh, that means that there's something um, inadequate about the vision system. And I should, that's why I should use temporal reasoning to smooth um, my uh, predictions over time to make sure I get something consistent. Um, but from another perspective, you can think about flickers as almost an indication that the system is correcting itself, that before what it thought was happening, um, uh, or rather now what it thinks is happening is different um, and a different interpretation from, from before. And those corrections could be a good thing. And so fundamentally, I think this reveals like a challenge in trying to um, adapt quickly um, to interpretations of a dynamic world. Um, and so something that's been sort of inspiring us to think about this um, is actually very old work um, from, uh, from, from Herbert Simon. Um, uh, is this, this, this sort of um, iconic um, exploration of, of issues in artificial intelligence and human behavior known as bounded rationality. And what was really interesting about this, and I think why this pertains to the, the previous slide, was that this was a, an acknowledgement of um, in early days of AI, there's a tendency to kind of formulate that as a search problem or an optimization problem. And um, this work of bounded rationality was, was a realization, well, actually real world intelligence, you always have access to finite resources and finite um, sort of views, views of the world. And so um, it, the, this was a, an, an, um, a sort of an assumption that we have to embrace that, that, that perspective. And maybe it's not really appropriate to think of as, a, as just an, a blind optimization problem. Uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that agents have to deal with uh, finite compute resources and finite um, uh, finite time to kind of analyze and react in the world. Um, and the reason why this was sort of consequential, consequential for human behavioral economics is because this could be one reason why people don't behave rationally all the time. Because a lot of the times we don't have enough resources and enough time to figure out what the right rational thing is to do. Um, and so this, this acknowledgement that these, this finite resources should be kind of endowed as a first class citizen when we think about building intelligent algorithms, um, I think was really sort of revolutionary. And it was, uh, as far as I know, it's the only work that's ever been jointly awarded a Turing Award in Computer Science and the Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, so what we're gonna do is, is very much embrace this view and say, let's think about designing vision algorithms and even autonomy systems that make efficiency and sort of acknowledge the access to limited compute as a, as a, as a first class citizen. Now, um, at, at, at sort of first blush, one might think, well, isn't this already well-tread territory? Uh, because right now, if you look at sort of computer vision algorithms, you'll routinely see graphs that look like this, which is on one axis, we plot performance, and this is performance of an object detector. And if you're familiar with different kinds of detection systems like YOLO or retina net. Uh, but on the, the, the y-axis here, you know, higher means that this is a higher accuracy system for detecting people or detecting cars. On the x-axis is listed inference time, um, or the way that I want to think, think about this is latency. It's sort of how many milliseconds does it take for this prediction to be computed from this algorithm or network. Um, and what you invariably see is there's a way to trade these, trade these things off. Um, if you're willing to spend more compute time, you can get higher accuracy, sometimes significantly higher accuracy for understanding what's happening out, ha happening in the world in front of you. Okay, but then um, the thing I wanted to sort of emphasize here was that um, uh, when you kind of plot the performance of these algorithms, uh, at first blush, they look pretty good. So this is the result of taking some state-of-the-art object detector and running it on streams from these embodied uh, autonomous vehicle sensors. Um, but what's, what's kind of striking is that if you actually go sit in one of these cars, what you see is something very different. Uh, and what you see is something closer to the right-hand side. Um, and 
and what the, you, you see this sort of misalignment between predictions and what the actual sensor is seeing. And it, if you just think about it for the second, um, it kind of makes total sense because um, in order to run the algorithm, it takes some amount of time, let's say 100 milliseconds. And by the time the algorithm finishes, the input that it was processing is stale, it becomes out of date. So if you just show the, the most recent sensor setting combined with the most recent output, you'll always get this mismatch. And for a long time, I thought this was actually a bug in somehow the, the visualization. Um, but what I'm going to try to argue for, to you folks is that, no, no, this is actually a fundamental statement about real-time embodied perception. Um, and let, let's try to sort of uh, dig into this a bit more. So um, an, another perspective of, uh, of, of what I just said is that um, sort of came from a, a fellow, fellow colleague um, who, who made this observation. Um, and he said, well, maybe sometimes actually using a less accurate detector or less accurate vision system could improve the overall performance of, of the autonomous uh, stack if, um, if it was able to react faster because less accurate systems oftentimes are lower latency. And it could be that then because you're now able to react to changes in the environment, um, you'll actually be a safer overall system. Um, and so that really struck me, th this observation. Um, and what, what that suggests to me is that when we actually think about perception, we should actually, um, within context of this, uh, this full autonomy stack, we should actually think about, well, what is the final task that we want to optimize? And that could be, I think, essentially um, how, we, how well we act in the world. So an end-to-end -end metric might be how well we avoid obstacles in motion planning. Now you can ask yourself, let me evaluate different perception systems with different latencies and see which one actually maximizes my, my, my end metric, which is how well I can act in the world. Um, but the problem is that um, this kind of end to end optimization, while attractive, um, could be difficult to do and might even be dangerous. Um, we don't want to actually deploy something that's, uh, that's, that's, um, that, that could cause uh, harm. Um, so instead, um, uh, let's see, and, and another sort of uh, point I sort of like to make is that as, as sort of vision as a community, I think has done really well by actually not going all the way to the final application, but instead describing or defining kind of proxy metrics um, that allow us to abstract away the, what the actual vision system is gonna be used for. So for example, um, things like pixel classification error or object detection average precision. By optimizing these things, we hope that we also optimize our ability to act and behave in a, in a, in a successful way. Um, but the claim I wanna make is that maybe we've sort of abstracted away that a little too much. And uh, maybe there are similarly other um, uh, convenient metrics we could define that would allow us to still um, uh, sort of uh, crank on vision, but in a, in, in a true embodied sense, so that it's targeted for um, an agent that will actually use it in the real world. Um, and so here's actually the, the kind of key insight. Um, and that is when we think about real time processing uh, of a stream of sensor data, um, we should think about it in a continuous world, not in a discrete world. Um, and so uh, something that we sort of struggled with is that common definitions of real time, usually um, one thing we've seen in the past is that if you have sensors that are being um, recorded at a fixed rate, let's say uh, 30 frames a second or roughly 30 milliseconds between every sensor recording, maybe real time means one definition could be um, your algorithm should finish before the next frame arrives. Um, but the, uh, um, but the problem with that is that is sort of too tied to the actual sensor rate. You can imagine in the real world, if your sensor rate was very slow, uh, for example, LIDAR typically is 10 Hertz. Um, somehow it doesn't make sense to say that if, if an object or a person appears in between two LIDAR measurements, um, like 50 milliseconds in, that somehow you're not responsible for reacting to them. Like ultimately we do act in a continuous time world. Um, so the claim is, is we want to come up with a, a way of evaluating algorithms, evaluating vision algorithms that reflect the continuous time nature of the task. Uh, we want to evaluate it all time instance. Um, and essentially, the evaluation is going to be given by this visual in this video. So what we're going to do is essentially run a vision algorithm live on uh, a hardware compute stack 
and look at the output that it produces, which is the stuff on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and <clears throat> we're gonna compare it with the ground truth and look at the accuracy of that. Um, and so intuitively, you can kind of see this in, in sort of two, two simplistic ways. You can imagine running uh, a very fast detector that finishes before the next frame arrives, or a very slow detector that takes a bunch of frames um, before it can even process, because uh, maybe it takes um, five seconds to, to process a, a given frame. But importantly, even the slow detector, we're, it'll still be responsible for reporting the state of the world, even if it's not done computing the last frame. Um, and so what it might just do is uh, spit out the last known state of the world, and that's the visual we see on the left. Um, but now we can benchmark the left set of predictions versus the ground truth, and then see uh, how, how well it performs. And so we're gonna call this essentially a streaming uh, image understanding metric. So if we start with AP for benchmarking object detectors, this gives us streaming AP. Um, and the philosophy that we're gonna espouse here is that we can actually now, now that we have this well-defined metric that, that tells us how well we can analyze the state of the world at all time instants, we can now optimize for the metric. Maybe we can design networks and representations that, that, uh, that improve streaming AP. Um, now, this is, this is very similar to work on, uh, this is very inspired by work on, uh, on anytime processing. Um, but essentially, one, one of the key differences between the way it's typically formulated there is that oftentimes anytime processing, you're, you're sort of computing on a contract. You have to finish processing um, a previous frame before the next frame arrives. Um, but the way we're formulating this is, no, 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 you don't have to finish processing. You can choose to keep processing, but you must report back the state of the world. Um, because we, we really want to operate in this continuous time world. Okay, so the, the sort of take home, um, some of the take home points there is that um, uh, in the offline case, if you were to analyze a solution um, where you don't have to, you, you get to report that you get to report back the state of the world, and you're not penalized for how much latency it takes. Um, you actually you get something like thirty six percent performance. Um, and this is the way we normally evaluate performance in our in our plots. But then the argument is that, no, 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 we should actually evaluate in this online way uh, on the left-hand side. And the first point there is that performance drops from 36% to 6% AP. So the, the first argument we want to make is that this is actually a really hard problem, and hopefully more folks should look at this. Um, but what I'll describe is just a few things that we've tried to actually um, uh, sort of optimize for this metric, and we can actually we can recover about half the performance drop. Um, but uh, there's still clearly more to be done. But even by doing this, uh, there's a number of interesting behaviors that emerges. Um, first is that actually along these these traditional curves people plot of performance versus uh, versus latency, there's a sweet spot. Um, if you go at one end and make your detectors really fast, um, and by doing so typically inaccurate, you don't do so great. And if you go to the other end of making your detectors highly accurate, but they end up being really slow, you also don't do so great. Um, but if you kind of tune, you just sort of try out different detectors with different backbones and different image resolutions, you can find one that actually maximizes your, uh, your streaming accuracy. And essentially what this is doing, it's almost finding an, out, an underlying frequency at which um, uh, the detector wants to be run. The next interesting thing that sort of pops out of this is that if you really want to optimize streaming image understanding accuracy, it turns out what you should really do is not just do a kind of a zero throat or hold prediction of where you, what you think is happening, um, where if, if you're not able to look at the most recent frame, instead of just saying that, well, the last thing I saw, let me report the state of the world, um, it's better to model the world as, as slightly ballistic. So, um, if you're not able to see what's actually happening, the last time you saw the world, um, you think it continues to change the same way it was changing before. Um, so what that would require is if I could estimate velocities, then I'll just assume that things continue to move with the, the last velocity I saw. But this requires a bit of tracking. Um, so what this shows is that if you actually track and then forecast, you predict where in the future um, objects could be, that will also improve the streaming accuracy quite a bit. Um, and then finally, there's sort of interesting phenomena that um, uh, it's just sort of like a, a, a detail that pops up that, that I was sort of shocked by. And that is, if you think of the rate at which, um, let's say, um, if you think of this notion of 
um, whenever an algorithm finishing, finishes processing a frame, it should just go grab the next frame that's available that's been previously sampled and start processing it. That's the sort of idle free philosophy. <clears throat> but it turns out sometimes it actually makes sense to not do that and to wait. And you can imagine that if you finish processing something just before a new sensor frame arrives, um, it's better to wait for that new frame rather than immediately processing something that will become stale very quickly. Um, so this gives a, a kind of counterintuitive result that sometimes if you want to um, um, uh, kind of, uh, if you want to, uh, sometimes if you want to increase your ability to react quickly and dynamically, the optimal thing to do is to sit and wait, um, which sounds kind of counterintuitive. Um, so essentially, uh, what, what, what we find is the optimal thing is actually to take a decision theoretic approach of sometimes you wait and sometimes you don't, depending upon how, how when you think the next frame will arrive and how much computation you think it'll take. Um, even though I sort of motivated this all in terms of how you would actually build perception for a real autonomous system, I think this is also, to me, very evocative of how human biology works. Um, so human reaction time is also um, uh, somehow around 200 milliseconds. And so it becomes very clear that when humans do high precision uh, skilled maneuvers, such as hitting or catching a ball moving at 100 miles an hour, um, like a fastball in baseball, you must be doing some kind of predictive processing. Because when you actually look, uh, when your eyes see something, and if it takes 200 milliseconds for your visual cortex to process it and then give a neurological signal to then move your hand, by the time you can actually move your hand, the ball's traveled around 30 meters. Um, and so that means that you must be forecasting in order to be able to catch it properly. You must be predicting where it will be when you should move your hand. Um, and so uh, this sort of notion of predictive forecasting and even having asynchronous scheduling um, is very suggestive of things that we believe is happening in the, in the human visual cortex. Um, so, so it feels like these are actually um, sort of somehow fundamental to at least biological intelligence as well and biological perception. Okay. Um, so um, I want to sort of stress that if, if you sort of take this view, there's two kinds of things, um, uh, let's see, that uh, are sort of two, I feel like uh, perhaps maybe underexplored aspects of streaming perception that our previous analysis suggests. And one is we should um, expand on methods of forecast. Um, and so there's recent work with colleagues that we've done about trying to create a large scale data set for, for tracking and forecasting. Um, and the other thing that our previous analysis suggests is that tracking is super important in this sort of low latency uh, compute constrained regime because it allows you to forecast. Um, the other kind of interesting thing that we find is that uh, current trackers seem to be much too slow uh, to actually help improve this streaming accuracy. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time here, um, what I will do is uh, I'll just show uh, a couple of other sort of um, uh, sort of projects in this space. And so one here is a, is a biologically inspired uh, take on tracking through temporal priming. So what I'm showing on the left-hand side is an example of a model that's sort of run per frame on a stream. On the right-hand side is a model that's run per frame on a stream, but one is 10 times faster than the other. And the, the trick for uh, exploiting that is the model on the right-hand side is actually being dynamically learned online. Um, and it's tuning itself to the statistics of what it's currently seeing. Um, and so this sort of comes from a, a, a pretty simple, but, but I think kind of cute observation that if you actually think of processing um, data from a particular stream, um, the data that you see there is actually much less varied than the data, uh, than the diverse world that, that um, uh, of, of all visual complexity. Um, and so rather than building a generic car detector, maybe we just want to build a car detector for a particular surveillance camera uh, that's looking at a particular uh, intersection. And that seems like it should be a much simpler problem. Um, and so we're going to, um, one approach for doing that is essentially we're going to run some expensive high accuracy model in, um, on frames from that stream. Um, and then we're going to train something that's very small and cheap and then fast to run. Um, and so this idea of, of student, uh, students teaching um, or teaching a student network by distilling the knowledge from a teacher 
is, uh, is sort of uh, widely known and, and, and very common, but now we're gonna use this as a way of, of automatically specializing generic knowledge to a particular scenario. Um, but one of the difficulties here is that actually it's hard to collect lots of data from one particular camera stream um, to encounter all the, that sort of sufficiently samples all the variation that you'd see in that sample stream. Um, we can apply the same intuition again, which is instead of trying to build a car detector for this particular camera stream, let's build a car detector for just the last five minutes of this camera stream. So just the current weather conditions, the current time conditions. Um, so what that suggests is we're going to do this teacher training and student learning live on the actual data stream that we're processing. And we can do this very simply by just, um, we call the student network a, a JITnet. Uh, we run a, a blue teacher every once in a while that's very high accurate. And we use it to train this very simple um, and lightweight uh, model on the fly. Um, and there's lots of sort of interesting work that needs to be, uh, interesting question that needs to be solved here, which is um, how do you know when to call the teacher um, and how do you make sure that you can reliably learn from the, the, the teacher in terms of the information that it's giving with, with, uh, with regard to positive labels and negative labels? Um, um, the other interesting question that pops up is that now as part of live inference, you actually are doing learning on the fly. Um, and so that means that you must be able to learn really efficiently in order for this story to work. Um, and so we've done some work on how do you learn under extremely resource constrained settings where you're not even allowed to pass through your training data once. Um, let's say sort of uh, you do less than an epoch of learning. And it turns out here you can do some things to dramatically increase the accuracy of, um, of sort of uh, resource constrained learning. Um, so, so the end result here is you can end up, if you put this sort of system together, um, uh, you can end up with a lightweight system for, for segmentation and perhaps detection that will mimic the behavior of this uh, um, um, sort of expensive system, but it'll be much faster. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'll just sort of give two, two advertisements um, for sort of work in this space. So um, one of the things that we sort of realized in um, we think about uh, trying to understand things in, a, in an embodied streaming setting is that um, tracking becomes so important. Um, and what we found is when we looked at sort of the tracking literature, um, we found it sort of difficult to understand. Um, sometimes there's trackers that are tailored for one particular scenario or domain. Um, and one of the things that seems it has seemed to have helped the, the image understanding literature like object detection is to really focus on very diverse data sets for, for training and evaluation. Um, and so we've collected this large scale data set that we think is similarly diverse as large scale tracking data set that's similarly diverse to image data sets. Um, and we're um, holding uh, an upcoming workshop to try to uh, kind of get folks from the tracking community um, um, kind of talking about, let's say, like a, a large scale diverse challenge that contains many, many different kinds of objects that we would like to track. Um, the, the thought is for sort of, um, sort, of, um, sort of downstream video analysis, it feels like tracking should really be a substrate that subsequent um, systems or subsequent sort of reasoning modules are built on. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case right now for, the, for a lot of sort of video processing. Um, yeah, let's play a game. Oh, sorry, here. Um, what I'm showing here is uh, an example of another benchmark for tracking. Actually, we sort of thought about this as a, as a benchmark for tracking and, um, and action recognition that actually uh, looks at um, kind of this, it, it's been inspired by this cup and balls game of when you're trying to track a ball as it becomes contained and occluded by other objects. Um, and so what's kind of interesting about this is this sort of adversarial tracking. Someone is trying to hide the position, uh, the spatial temporal position of an object over time. And it turns out that you can kind of simulate this really well and now use this as a benchmark for evaluating essentially spatial temporal reasoning and spatial temporal tracking and even other things like action recognition. Um, so, um, okay, so that was really the, the, the first meaty section on, um, on streaming processing. So hopefully the, the kind of take home um, messages there was, um, it seems like we can move and envision from um, there's sort of two regimes of, we can think of like single frame processing, which is, um, let's say a lot of recognition systems are sort of built in this philosophy. 
Um, but if it really embraces this view of continuous time streaming processing, um, I think that sort of causes a bunch of interesting behaviors and representations to emerge, such as ones that require you to make decisions about when and where to compute. And also it embraces this notion of online learning from a stream. Um, as the data comes in, you're continually improving um, your, your, your system. Okay, okay. Um, the other thing that I think is super um, crucial about um, sort of in, uh, vision in, a, in an embodied in the wild setting is that um, the, the kind of open world nature of the problem. So here's a scenario that I'm always motivated by. Consider a trash can that falls over on the street and a bunch of debris falls out and moves. Um, traditional, I think a lot of the ways in which we think about um, a visual understanding is very closed world. We, we enumerate a list of objects and we build detectors and classifiers for all of them. Um, but it seems like that might not work in a case like this. Like, do we expect that we'll have a detector for every type of debris that we might see? Um, and in practice, these kinds of uh, embodied autonomous agents, what they actually end up doing is something that's much more geometric. Um, and I think this is why LIDAR sensors and depth sensors have been so profoundly transformative because it gives you the ability to geometrically process a scene. And now it doesn't really matter what that obstacle's name is. Um, the first thing that you realize is that there is an obstacle there just because you can extract the geometry. Um, and so this suggests that sort of really embracing geometric processing and what I would think of more as lower level vision um, uh, processing as, as tools for robustly being able to understand any kinds of objects and um, ultimately any complex scenarios that, that you might encounter. Um, so we've done some work on taking the uh, sort of taking depth sensor readings and trying to uh, segment them um, using data-driven methods. So um, essentially, I guess one of, the, one, of the, one of the arguments I'm trying to make is um, segmentation is a very popular task that, that is uh, like a flagship task is much understanding, but typically it's viewed as sort of class specific segmentation. And I'm gonna argue instead of thinking about segmentation as a perceptual grouping problem, which is really class agnostic. We're just trying to understand what pixels or what ladder points go together. Because once you understand what objects are there, then it's much easier to track and predict and forecast how things will evolve over time. And so we've done some work where we've tried to take the problem of object detection or object segmentation and then turn it into this graph theoretic problem of how do you group LIDAR points together so you can identify um, where, where the objects actually are. Um, it turns out there's some, there's some sort of fun theoretical uh, tricks you could be, uh, do there. Um, and let me just sort of just leave you with one, one kind of cute observation for an upcoming paper um, on LIDAR processing, which is even though I said that this was 3D data that comes from a, a LIDAR sensor, um, in fact, um, we're gonna make the argument that it's actually not 3D data because it still suffers from occlusions. I cannot see behind an object, uh, merely because of the physics of how the sensor works. You know, uh, a photon um, leaves the, 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 the laser mounted on the, the LIDAR frame, it hits an object and it, and it comes back. And so we can never go past the object that it hit. Um, but what that means though, is that you also have knowledge besides just knowing that there's a point out in space, you know, that along that ray that was, that was empty. And it turns out that you can build representations that encode that explicit knowledge of all the stuff being empty between the point and the sensor. And so that's a visual here shown on the, on the, on the right-hand side. So this is a bird's eye view of a, of a, of a LIDAR scene um, censored by a, um, a censored by an autonomous vehicle. And I, we sort of draw two red circles on the left-hand side. Uh, that represent regions where you don't see lots of points inside. And we can ask ourselves, could either of these be a, a car? Um, and if you locally process those LIDAR points, you might say uh, equally yes or no. But if you actually encode free space, which is those green, the green region on the right-hand side, if you encode, okay, what do I know must be empty because I saw a LIDAR point past that region, then you know that it's actually, it's, it's much more likely that there's something um, on the left hand, uh, the left hand side of the red circle, as opposed to the the right hand side uh, red circle, um, and so by designing representations that reason that um, explicitly encode free space um, uh, into their model, uh, it turns out you can get sort of pretty significant benefits. Um, so I encourage folks to sort of look at this if you're if you're interested. Um, 
And so can we, can we, can we kind of extend our insights to other kinds of, um, can we extend our insights to other kinds of modalities? Uh, so we've done work on sort of high res stereo um, and I'll sort of skip a, a bunch of this as well. Um, but it's still sort of in this view of how can we design very efficient systems for real time processing of streams so that we can get geometry out and scene understanding and recognition out so that we can then react accordingly. Um, um, and finally, one more thing that we've done in the context of sort of low level vision understanding for understanding objects in the open world is really, um, uh, let's say, um, use motion as a first class citizen. So um, I think, um, maybe I'll go to the next slide here, that um, something that's always been sort of intrigued me is um, well, we're trying to build embodied systems for understanding the, the complex world as we navigate and move in, in, inside of it. How do other systems do this? Things like, uh, how does a fly or rat, um, uh, how are they able to navigate and understand geometry and predict and forecast? Um, and there's lots of biological evidence to suggest that motion plays a huge role. Uh, essentially, by looking at how pixels move or flow in the image frame, we can make estimates about time to contact, about how long it will take before um, a moving uh, ego motion, uh, ego vehicle um, will, will contact with the surface. Um, and so we've done work that basically extends that, that line of thinking um, uh, to uh, use motion-based cues for, actually let me show here, motion-based cues for generically finding all kinds of objects. So here's an example for someone riding with uh, one of these e-scooters, which right now we don't have pre pre-built detectors for. But if you now try to detect and segment by grouping pixels that move similarly to each other, you can actually uh, detect um, and properly segment this object, even though the system's never seen an example of this before. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and then, um, so this is sort of a, a little quick, quick view of how to do 3D shape understanding. Um, as a motivated by this notion that we really want to build systems that can understand any kinds of objects that we see in the future uh, or any, any kinds of objects we see before us. And then finally, um, the last kind of issue that I think is, is crucial, crucially important to deal with is the fact that um, the data that we see, um, actually, let me move here. Uh, actually, let me, yeah, let me start here. The data that we see, um, one of the big challenges is validation. How do we know that if we have a system for doing perceptual understanding that, um, how do we know all the blind spots of where it could, where it could get confused? Um, and so uh, I think of this as actually, in my own personal view, like perhaps the hardest problem in, uh, in, in, the, in the autonomous vehicle space. Um, and so th some of the things we've been looking at here are, um, there's particular scenarios that are incredibly dangerous um, and risky and they're so rarely observed, how can you build faith that you've designed a perception system that is going to work well in these cases? Um, and something we've been pursuing is essentially using some form of synthetic data. So uh, people have suggested this as well. And maybe I'll sort of skip to um, sort of different kind of uh, little, little sort of nuggets of uh, sort of our perspective on, on the synthetic data problem. Um, so one thing we can do is instead of actually going all the way to a full-fledged simulator um, or a rendering engine, which might be reasonable, um, I almost want to make an analogy to kind of um, uh, image-based rendering, so which is a technique from, from computer graphics where new images are generated by rearranging pixels from existing images. So we've looked at work where you have existing images, where you have, let's say, objects that have been labeled and masked out, where you literally cut and paste objects uh, between each other. Uh, so here's an example of, um, so for example, um, right now, you probably don't see lots of horses in urban environments, but it turns out you do see some when you see uh, horse-mounted police. And so because we will see, so you'll see that so rarely, if you want to both validate your system against that and train on that, maybe one technique is to literally kind of cut and paste images of horses into these scenes. Um, that sounds a little simplistic, but essentially that's kind of the idea of, of taking a image-based approach to rearranging existing pixel data to find new virtual um, combinations of objects um, that can be better used to validate systems. Another view on that is not just sort of virtual combinations of objects, but virtual camera views. So here's an example of upcoming work where you take 
of a dynamic scene where people are moving along with other along with other objects where um, we could synthesize a virtual camera even though that wasn't observed by using similar kinds of essentially image-based rendering techniques that have been adapted to the, the neural deep world. Okay, um, so essentially I wanted to, uh, th th that's, that's, that's sort of the, the, the kind of end, end, end ending of the story here. So if we kind of look back at the, the arguments we're trying to lay out for how to think of embodied setting, um, I'm sorry, embodying perception in the world, um, the first thing that I think the community hasn't, um, it, it might be fun to embrace more, I think it will be important to embrace more, is this notion of streaming processing. Um, that we should actually be trying to perceive and act in a continuous time world. Um, and, and we have to do that in order to sort of make decisions about the world. And as we're observing the world, we should be learning more about it so that we can make better decisions. Um, it's super important to be able to react to anything and any kind of rare scenarios that we might encounter. And so there we think the um, a solution that um, is very classic, but, but let's say maybe, maybe it's not explored as other settings is um, really relying on low level cues such as shape and geometry and motion to help understand peculiar, unusual objects and scenarios that we might not have seen before. Um, and finally, a central challenge is how do you validate systems so that you can trust their behavior? Um, and um, it seems like if you're gonna, if you wanna validate on scenarios that you don't actually, that are very hard to see in practice, We'll have to do some version of combining training data and synthesizing um, test data. Um, and so we've explored some, some approaches there for compositing and uh, generating different views. And, and with that, I think I will end this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dale, for this exciting talk. I'm sure there are many questions that the audience would like to ask you. And this will be the will be opportunity to ask him questions during our discussion session later today. Uh, so, but now I would like to introduce our next speaker and uh, actually my colleague at Indrea, uh, Cordelia Schmidt. Cordelia Schmidt has a very bright and fast career in computer vision. So she has a, a PhD from um, Indrea in, or in Grenoble uh, in um, uh, fast image search and uh, so she got a prize for it and uh, so this work actually laid down um, uh, ground for the whole field of fast image search which is now implemented in uh, lots of different systems uh, on a google scale for image search and not only in google uh, so Cordelia has done lots of other contributions also in, in uh, object recognition and action recognition she has received uh, high distinctions, such as a co prize for fundamental contributions in computer vision in 2018 and the Royal Society Mindley Award in 2020. And uh, today, Cordelia will be talking about automatic video understanding. And Cordelia is actually online with us today. And uh, please, during your talk, you can uh, ask her questions. And uh, yeah, uh, please listen to the talk. Hello, my name is Kuya Schmidt, and I'm going to present today recent results and action recognition in videos. Today, the amount of videos available online is growing daily. There are sites such as BBC and INA, where there are movies and TV channels which are recorded, and there are loads of material available. Furthermore, with whereas YouTube, where the amount of videos is growing daily even more significantly. To access this video content, we have to see and understand what's in there. One task is to classification of short clips. We break the existing videos into small chunks and classify them into actions such as answering phone and handshake. Another application would be classification of activities. We take longer videos and want to understand what's the content in this video. For example, here, is an example of birthday party or and grooming an animal. However, if we want to understand the video content more precisely, we want to, we need to know where the people are in the video and what kind of action they're performing. This is particularly important for self-driving cars. We want to localize the pedestrians precisely and to want to also predict what are the next actions they're going to perform. 
Similarly, it's important for video surveillance where we want to know where the people are and what kind of actions they're performing. Is there anything dangerous happening in the scene? And finally, the ultimate goal of automatic video understanding is to have a complete description of a video. For this video here, you would like to know, as the van Hagenbeckel takes into the table, they pass by the piano and the woman looks at Sam. In order to have such a precise description, we need to localize the people, their interactions among themselves and their interactions with the environment and objects. To do so, we need to have a precise way of interpreting every action and every actor in the scene. Action recognition has several difficulties. Actions can appear in a large variation of appearances. We can have viewpoint changes, interclass variations, and camera motion. The manual collection of training data is difficult, much more difficult than it is with object categories and still images as there are many more action categories, and many of them occur only rarely. Furthermore, applied annotation would mean that we also annotate the pose, the object, and the interaction between people. This makes it even more difficult. Another complication is that the action vocabulary is not well defined. We don't know today what is the action similarity and how to present composite action. In this talk, I'll present four of our recent works. The first one is on spatial temporal action recognition. The second one is on how to model the relations between spatial and temporal interactions between actors and objects. The next one is on action forecasting. And the final one is on recent results on behavior prediction for self-driving cars. Spatial temporal action localization requires localizing the person in space and time. The top row is an example for drinking. You want to precisely know at which moment in time in the video the person is drinking. Similarly, the bottom row shows an example for brushing teeth. You want to know when the child is brushing the teeth and for how long the teeth brushing is going on. As a potential application, you could see this that the, the, the parent are watching and monitoring remotely how long the child is brushing its teeth. State-of-the-art approaches first extract and categorize action on a per-frame basis. Then they track these per-frame basis action sections over video and score the temporal localization precisely in time. However, this is suboptimal because if you observe an action only in one frame, it can be ambiguous. The example we see here, we don't know if the person is sitting down or standing up. However, if we have additional frames at our decision, we can see that on the top row, the person is sitting down, and on the bottom row, the person is standing up. The approach we have introduced takes into account several frames simultaneously. We start off with a rigid anchor cuboid, which is fixed, has a fixed spatial extent over time and then perform a classification and regression based on this fixed anchor point at the end of cuboid. The anchor cuboid is scored and can be dissolved to take to follow precisely the person in time. The approach is based on a parallel architecture which, which has several SSD detectors parallel in time. Each SSD detector extracts a set of multiple layers for different spatial extents. These layers, which you can see here in yellow, red, and purple, represent the localization of the actor and the action at a given resolution. We now take this representation, this convolutional map, and stack it up over time, and then have an additional layer which takes the stacks representation and classify uses them to classify and regress. Classification has therefore more input to make the decision and regression can then take into account neighboring frames to have a better localization of the action in the tuplet. 
For our experiments, we use two data we are data on one, which has 24 sports actions, and the A1 data set, which is a more recent data set and contains 80 actions in a much larger video volume. So here we have 300,000 video movie segments which have been annotated with the action. If you look at the results, you measure video mean average precision. This means we have the spatial temporal overlap, 0, 2, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 75. And for this spatial temporal overlap, we have the precision recall curves and take the, the mean average precision of those. We can see that our approach outperforms the state of the art, and even more so for higher overlap thresholds for which the localization accuracy has to be more precise. If we now look at a few results, you can see in green the ground truth and yellow the detections. So here in this first example, we correctly detect the action and we localize them very precisely in time. So here, all the cases we show here, we have the correct action label classified. And we can also see that the localization in time is very precise. So here we have these tubelets, which we, know, know, which we managed to adapt. And given that they're well adapted, we managed to follow the person very precisely in space. Another example, small child riding a bike. And here, a more difficult example where the child is bringing on the trampoline but makes it actually quite challenging to localize precisely. Finally, to failure modes, the first one, we don't manage to localize precisely in time. And the second one, we have two people interacting. We can see actually that our model has difficulties separating these people to people precisely. So this shows that if we have two people interacting, we need to have a more precise model, which takes into account the spatial temporal interactions between people here or also between people and objects. I'll present an approach to do so in the second part of my talk. If we look at fairly cases for detection, we have seen previously one of the two ice dancers dancing together, but another fairly current cases are shown here. So the first one is a false answer for shaking hand. The man is really just reaching out the arm. The second one is a forced answer for smoking. What the man does, he covers the mouth. And the third one is a false answer for right. The man is just looking down. The model we have introduced to perform a better relation between spatial and temporal interactions goes as follows. A, we have a a person detector, and then post a model to associate for people over time. This extracts us actor cubelet, where an actor cubelet is a cubelet which follows an actor along the video content. The second stream is an object detector, which follows the object along the, the video stream. And then we have a relation graph, which models the interactions between the humans and the object. So here we can see it as a circle, the humans, and a square, the object. And the output would then be actor one is talking and holding an object, talking to another person, and holding an object X to so detect the person he's interacting with and the object he's interacting with. We also introduce a component for temporal dependency of learning. Once we have constructed the cubelets, the cubelets have constructed based on appearance similarity, the Siamese network and triplet loss. So this learn allows us to learn the similarities, which allows us to follow the humans and match them to the triplet. And the next step is, in order to represent the sequence of actions within this triplet, we learn how to understand the features and how to, to learn the representation of the sequence with the graph convolution. This is the first step of our approach. The second step, is a relation modeling, so we model human to human and human to object interactions, and then the model learns the top assignment to integrate these features. If you look at quantitative results on the AVA data set, we can see 
that a single frame model obtains an AP of 14% by adding the, the tuplet model, which just models the relations in time, we gain 7% improvement by adding and by adding a further relation model, we gain another percent of improvement. This is a significant gain in performance. However, the results are still low. This is due to two facts. A, the problem is very hard because many of the actions in the test are very sparse to obtain natural result of false positives. And second, for many times there are not enough training examples. So one thing we're currently working on is how to mine automatically from the web additional training examples. I'll now show two Qualities examples. The first one, we can see that by just using the baseline, the action is labeled incorrectly as sit. However, if we add our temporal dependencies, which model how the action evolves over time, we can see that the example is labeled correctly as fall down. Here, an illustration of our relation modeling, we can see. On the left, the baseline, the relation is modeled, the, the action is modeled as hold, because so the person is holding actually a fork in his hand, which is correct. However, if we learn the more precise relations of the person and its environment, we can actually see that the correction, the correct action is the person is holding a fork. I'll now present work on action forecasting. If the goal here is to see what is the next action the person is performing. So we have, for example, somebody who wants to cross the road. I want to see if the bike should wait or not. Similarly, the child is running towards the stairs. And we want to predict if the person, if the child is going to fall down the stairs or not. Here we see, can see a couple of examples. The people are sitting on the left are sitting and talking. And what you would want to do is to predict the next action clink class. In the middle, they're holding and standing, and the next action would be serving. On the right, they're hanging and standing, and the next action would be kissing. The model we have introduced to do this action forecasting goes as follows. We have the past, the present, and the future actions. We want to model jointly the past and the present actions, and then predict the future actions. This requires the temporal sequences. Here, we model the temporal sequences with the gated recurrent wounded model. And it also requires modeling the spatial interactions in a frame. To do so, we use the action, we have an action actor proposal network, which detects potential action, actions, and the feature network, which learns the correlations of the actors with potential objects or other actors in the scene. The actor interactions are modeled by a graph neural network, and on top of this graph neural network, we have the, recur the, recur the recurrency modeled by a gated recurrent unit model. Nodes are proposed by region proposal network, and then we learn the actions via an attention mechanism. If you look at the result here, you can see that if you predict the actions at the next time step, so T does one, it is like one, one second in the future ahead. We can see that by using our join model, we get a significant improvement of just over just in predicting the action given the, the current, current frame. So we just take the current frame and we predict the actions one, one second ahead. We have 9% mean average precision accuracy. And then if we add different components of our model, we can see that we get a 7% increase of performance. We can see that overall the performance is still very low for action prediction. And this is quite natural because here it's very complicated. We have 80 actions and we want to predict 
the next action, so the chance level is low. Furthermore, the actions occur in natural videos, which makes the problem very complicated. If you look at a few examples, on the left, we can see the video up to frame T. We forecast the action eating. This is kind of natural because as you see that the hands of the man go towards food, which is below him. And if you look at the results we obtain in subsequent frames, what's going to happen really, you can see that our prediction of eating is correct and that the man is really eating. Another example, you can see on the left the, frame up, the video up to frame T and the forecast is getting up. And if you look what happens in reality in the video, we can really see that the boy is getting up. Another two examples on the top, the forecast treating, which is actually correct. And in the bottom, the forecast opening the door, which is also correct. If you look now at the other cases, you can see on the top, the forecast getting up. And this is actually caused by wrong duration. So if you wait for a little longer, the guy is really getting up, but for now he's sitting down. So it's forecasting the errors due to wrong duration. And on the bottom, we can see an error due to multiple futures. So here the prediction is closed up, closing door, but in reality, the door is being opened. And so here, potential solution would be not to predict only one solution, but to predict multiple solutions to see, and then to see by, by following the, by observing further, which one is really the correct one. Finally, we have applied, we have recently developed an approach for behavior prediction for self-driving cars. What we want, we want to predict the intent of what the car is going to do next. So we can see on the left, we want to predict for the white car that is going to turn left. This is quite obvious if you see the lane, which is a lane for turning left. However, what it requires is we have to understand the scene. So we see that this is the left lane, and we also have to understand the dynamic behavior of the other vehicles in the scene. This is joint work with Waymo. Most approaches represent the the environment and the objects by images and encode behavior prediction with neural conditional neural networks. This is costly in time and memory. We have to do the convolutional computations and we have to store the images. Furthermore, such a model makes it challenging to model long range geometry as the receptive fields of the convolutional neural networks are limited in space. We have introduced an approach back to net in which the objects, the dynamic objects in the scenes are vectorized. As you can see here, we detect the cars and have the roadmap information. So the roadmap information is encoded by vectors. So for example, a line, it would represent the line by the two layers by the two lanes surrounding the lines and represented by vectors. And if you look at the trajectories of the car, again, we would detect the car and then model the, the trajectory of the car as a set of vectors. So this reduces the computation and the memory cost. Furthermore, we can then model significantly longer range correlations. The model we, we use, what we do is we encode the features and the agents by polylines. So we have points here, for example, signs, stop signs. We have polygons, which are, for example, crosswalks. And we have curves, such as line name boundaries or trajectories of the vehicle. A polyline is represented by a set of vectors, where each vector has a start and end position. It will be all of the attributes. Here we can see these input vectors. So input vectors crosswalk, 
better eliminating the crosswalk, allowing the MC vectors representing the lanes of the client is representing by vector vectors and similarly with the agent. Each polyline, so for example, crosswalk, is represented by a subgraph, which connects the vectors of the corresponding polyline. And the graph neural network connects the vectors and is then encoded with a multi-layer perceptron. This is the first layer of our network, which models the geometry locally. Next, we also obviously want to model the interactions between the different components in the scene, between the po different polyline subgraphs. To do so, we introduce a global interaction graph. This is a graph which is fully connected. It connects all the components with each other, and it's implemented with self-attention. The training of our model is based on a large number of example sequences. What's important here is to ensure that the important example sequences are as varied as possible, so contain a lot of turning and etc. events, which are not just driving straight. Here we use two complementary losses. The first one is the standard L1 loss for trajectory prediction. And the second is the map completion loss. So similarly to the loss used in BERT models, we randomly mask our graph features and ensure that the model predicts them correctly. This enhances the structure understanding. So we know how the different components in our model work together. For our experiments, we have used the Argoverse motion forecasting data set contains approximately 300,000 five different long sequences. It includes vehicle trajectory and map information. As is, for, as is indicated by the data set, we use zero to two second intervals as the observation, and then two to five seconds for prediction. The observed trajectories here are obtained by an automatic perception system and do include noise. As metrics, we use average displacement error in meters computed over the entire trajectory, and we use the displacement error at t in meters, where t is one, two, or three seconds. Here we show an evaluation of the context information and the training objectives on the algorithm's data set. We can see if we just use the past trajectory of the target vehicle and then the uh, one loss, we obtain a displacement error of five meters. If we add the map information, get a significant reduction in error. If we also model the other vehicles, we get a further reduction in displacement error of three seconds. And finally, you can see that adding the map completion further decreases in error, which is actually nice. As you can see that this map completion really helps the model to create a better model. We can also see here, if we compare the state of the art solution network implemented the resident agent architecture, we can see that our model reduces the compute time significantly. Here, if you model 50 sequence, 50 equations per scene, we get a 20%, we only use 20% of the compute time. We reduce the number of parameters significantly. And furthermore, we get a 18% improvement in performance on the Arncomers data set. This is confirmed by an experiment on an in-house data set. Finally, if we also compare to the state of the art, you can see the outperform baseline, such as constant velocity, nearest neighbors, and the LSTM current network by the margin. We can also see that we outperform the winners of the competition also by margin. So this is trajectory predictions on the argo for the most likely trajectories. And here is the retreat result on the argo leaderboard, middle of May, middle of March. In conclusion, we have shown that you obtain excellent results for action recognition and behavior prediction. 
15 that we can now design models which take into account spatial and temporal representations. And we have seen the importance of designing sophisticated models based on graphical evolutions and self-attention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cordelia. Uh, we will have opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, after all the talks of today. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Vladimir Koltun, who has original background in theoretical computer science before he switched to computer vision and machine learning. So he has been an assistant professor at Stanford University, uh, and later a research in Adobe, and now he's a chief scientist for intelligent systems at Intel. So Vladimir has touched uh, many areas and made bright contributions to object detection, navigation, reinforcement learning, robotics, uh, and also low-level vision, such as segmentation. And today he will talk uh, about his recent results in some of these fields. And uh, Vladimir is here with us, and he will be happy to, uh, to, ask, uh, to answer questions on the chat. Uh, so please ask questions on the comment sections of uh, uh, under this window, and also you can leave your questions in the question area later for discussion. So let's welcome Vladimir. Hello. Today I will present some recent work towards machines that see in the real world. Let me begin with a basic question, which is, does computer vision even matter? And here is what I mean by this question. Uh, you are looking at an autonomous vehicle. This is a 20% scale autonomous car that is driving around a residential neighborhood in Munich. It is driven by a convolutional network that receives images as input and produces actions directly. It is driving the car directly based on image input without doing anything that we would recognize as explicit computer vision. It does not do explicit object detection. It does not do explicit depth estimation or semantic segmentation or optical flow estimation. Much of what the computer vision community spends time on in computer vision conferences and journals is not explicitly done in this work, yet the car drives. Here is what I mean by explicit computer vision. Uh, on the top, you see an image and a resulting semantic label map. Every pixel gets a semantic class. On the bottom, you see an image and a depth map. Every pixel gets an estimated distance from the camera. Most papers published in computer vision conferences and journals are devoted to tasks like this that produce explicit intermediate representations that describe the content of the scene from image or video input. Yet, I just showed you in the previous slide that a car can drive without doing any of that. So does this kind of explicit computer vision matter? This is the question that we asked recently in a paper that was published in the journal Science Robotics. And we conducted controlled experiments at scale to study this. Here's what we did. We trained agents in immersive three-dimensional environments. We used simulation to conduct controlled reproducible experiments at scale without endangering physical systems and physical infrastructure. Here are some of the environments uh, we trained sensory motor systems in. Here's an urban driving environment. You see it on the left. On the right, you see explicit intermediate representations such as depth, semantic segmentation, and optical flow. Here is an off-road uh, trail traversal task where the task is to remain on uh, the road. And here is a battle scenario. This is essentially the classic first-person uh, game, Doom in which you are maroon on a, an alien military base and you conduct uh, assertive uh, diplomacy. In each of these environments, we trained agents 
that were like that autonomous car that I showed you a few slides ago that acted directly based on raw visual input without constructing explicit intermediate representations, without performing explicit computer vision. We also trained agents that did receive explicit intermediate representations as input. We trained agents that did benefit from explicit computer vision of the kind studied in computer vision uh, research literature. What we found is that agents that received explicit intermediate representations of the kind produced in computer vision research trained faster and generalized better. These agents were more effective. It is true that systems that acted based on raw visual input with no inter explicit intermediate representations were able to reach certain levels of task performance that were quite non-trivial. But agents that benefited from computer vision, from explicit visual perception, from explicit intermediate representations were much more effective. In particular, they were much more effective in generalization. They were much more effective when they had to perform the task in new environments that they did not see and were unlike the environments that they saw during training. There was an interesting outcome of this experiment, which is that some intermediate representations seem to be more effective than others for the kinds of tasks that we studied. For the tasks that we studied, monocular depth estimation and semantic segmentation were the most effective intermediate representations. These two representations stood out as being particularly effective for training sensory motor systems that act based on uh, visual information. This motivated us to continue to invest in monocular depth estimation and semantic segmentation and try to obtain monoc monocular depth estimation and semantic segmentation models that were as strong, as effective, as general as possible. The next question is, how can we help? What can we do to make monocular depth estimation and semantic segmentation models as strong and general as possible? After all, there are hundreds of papers being published every year on these subjects, on these tasks in computer vision conferences. Have they been solved? Has everything been done? Are we at the end of the road? Well, the argument I would like to make is that perhaps the most interesting frontier for these computer vision tasks, for these computer vision models, is generality and robustness. Let me show you what I mean. Look at this happy dog. Look at this happy dog running through its environment and look at the diversity of uh, objects and entities and terrain uh, that it encounters along the way and let us admire its visual system that continues to serve it throughout. It continues to function in all of these diverse circumstances. Here's another dog, happy dog, playing on a farm. Here is another dog in a city now, running after a human in a skate park. And here is a dog lazily ambling about an apartment. The key point is that it is very easy to imagine all of these being the same dog. This could all be done by the same dog with one visual system, one 
visual system that continues to serve it throughout. And indeed, you could see all these environments with one visual system, a single visual system that allowed you to see all there was to see in all these different environments. We do not have anything like that in computer vision today. We do not have visual perception systems that are as general and robust in all these different domains as your visual system or the dog's visual system. A key question that would immediately occur to a computer vision professional uh, that tries to train uh, a general and robust vision system is which data set am I going to train on? There are domain specific data sets that uh, provide very good data for specific circumstances such as driving, for example. Driving is uh, a domain in which there is a plethora of excellent data sets. There are data sets for indoor environments in which you get a lot of good data for uh, indoors. And there are general data sets that span many domains, such as Microsoft Coco and AD20K. These are really excellent, tremendously useful data sets, but they tend to be a bit less granular and they tend to have less data in specific domains. So what we have are a large number of data sets that all provide different trade-offs that are all complementary. And none of them on its own is quite sufficient to train visual perception models with the level of generality and robustness that we really want for ubiquitous, robust, long-term, real-world deployment. So a methodology that we have been pursuing in a number of recent works is to mix data sets for training and to test on completely different, previously unseen data sets at test time. The key idea is that we perform a train test split, not within a data set as is customary, but across data sets. We take a large collection of data sets. We designate a subset of these data sets for training. We train on a mix of data sets. The intuition is that mixing data sets during training, mixing data sets that were collected by different teams at different times and different environments will yield more robust models that will generalize better to new domains. Now, how do we evaluate generalization to completely new domains? We test on data sets that were withheld data sets that were never seen during training, data sets that again were collected completely independently by different teams in different environments at different time. We withhold the number of data sets. We don't use any data from those data sets during training. We only use them for testing, for controlled evaluation of trained models. And the idea is that this kind of zero shot cross data set transfer is a rigorous evaluation protocol for performance in the real world. What you expect the system to encounter in the real world are new environments, new circumstances, previously unseen data that may have a different distribution. Our best proxy for simulating this kind of deployment on new data with a new distribution is to use data from completely different data sets that were not seen during training. And this is the essence 
of our methodology for training and testing robust computer vision models. We train on a mix of data set, data sets, data set mixing, and we test on completely different data sets that were withheld, that were not seen at training time, and we conduct controlled reproducible evaluation across data sets. Let me show you one project that operationalized this methodology and applied it to the task of semantic segmentation. This is uh, the MSEG project that is presented this year at CVPR. But you see at the top of this table, the top half of this table are data sets that we trained on. As I described, we designated a number of data sets, big diverse data sets for training. And we train on all of these data sets. We mix data sets during training. The bottom half of this table are data sets that we test on that are independent data sets that are not given to the model at training time and are just used for testing. So we perform a train test split at the level of whole data set. The key difficulty that we encountered in operationalizing this approach is that all the data sets have different taxonomies. They have different collections of classes. They have different notions of what an object is and what kinds of objects, what categories of objects exist. So to do this, we had to create a unified taxonomy that bridges all these different data sets. That's what we did according to a clear set of principles that are derived and presented in the paper. And I will refer you to uh, the paper for the details. There is a clear set of principles that we used in creating a unified taxonomy that bridges all of these data sets and allows us to mix them during training and then to transfer models from one data set to another, train on some subset of data sets from this large set, and then uh, test on a different set of data sets. Once we created this unified taxonomy, we had to bring the annotations in all these data sets into conformance with the unified taxonomy. We had to relabel data in all these different data sets to bring it into alignment with each other under the unified taxonomy. And that's what we did. And this involved relabeling hundreds of thousands of object annotations in all these different data sets. This was done through roughly one and a half years of animal, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk labeling effort. So we capped many Amazon Mechanical Turk employees happily employed for a long time during this project. Let me show you uh, what this can do. What do you see here uh, is a number of semantic segmentation models tested on the MSEG test data sets, Pascal VOC, Canvid, Wildash, Kitty, ScanNet, None of these data sets were seen during training by any of the tested models. And what are the tested models? The top part of the table lists models that were trained on a single existing data set uh, from the MSEG uh, training set. So for example, the top row is a model trained on Microsoft Coco and then tested zero shot on other data sets. The MSEG row towards the bottom of the table is a unified model trained on the entire MSEG training set with the relabeled data uh, that we created. And it is now tested on the same uh, test data sets. What you can observe is that some of the single data set models perform well on other data sets at test time. This happens 
when there happens to be a very good alignment between the data distributions in the different data sets. For example, the Microsoft Coco data set is very closely related to the Pascal VOC uh, data set. Uh, these data sets use uh, similar classes. Their notions of object are similar. The data collection protocols were related. Uh, the Microsoft Coco data set is essentially uh, a successor to the Pascal VOC data set. And you see that a COCO trained model performs well on Pascal VOC. But in such circumstances, the models lose performance on other data sets where there isn't such good alignment between the data distributions at training time and at test time. On the other hand, the MSEC trained model sustains high performance on all test data sets. And you can see this very well in the summary measure on the right, the hierarchical mean, uh, which summarizes performance across all test data sets. It is 59 here uh, for the MSEG model. The closest prior single data set model uh, gets a harmonic mean of uh, 46. And that's a model trained on COCO, which is if you're going to train on a single data set, your best bet. If you're going to train on a single data set, train on Microsoft COCO. But you're better off training on MSEC. Here's another interesting result. Um, this is the wild dash benchmark for robust semantic segmentation. This was a benchmark specifically collected to test the robustness of semantic segmentation models to unusual and extreme circumstances. So you see very challenging weather conditions like rain and snow, uh, very challenging lighting conditions like glare coming out of a tunnel, unusual scene content like animals on the road. The MSEG model, same model that you saw tested on various data sets in the previous slide, topped the Wild Dash leaderboard. It became number one on the Wild Dash leaderboard without any exposure to Wild Dash data during training. So this is zero shot cross data set transfer, no exposure to Wild Dash data. It became number one and it exceeded the performance of the previous leading models on that benchmark, which were fine tuned on Wild Dash data. So the MSEG model without exposure to wild dash data outperformed prior models that were allowed to peek into the data set and fine tune on it. Let me show you some qualitative results. All the results you're going to see here, all the clips are processed by a single model, a single MSEG trained model. And you will see that it works across all of these diverse domains. The labels that you see all come from this uh, unified taxonomy that we created. You will see a bit of temporal instability. We'll see some flickering, and that's because the model processes each image one by one, frame by frame. There is no temporal processing. This is not processed as a whole video volume. Each frame, each time step is processed independently. So don't mind the temporal flickering. But notice the robustness of the model across all these different domains. One model for all domains. Let me tell you now about a second project that operationalized this philosophy of data set mixing and zero shot cross data set transfer. In this project, we applied this approach to monocular depth estimation. The top part of this table shows training data sets. These are data sets that we trained on our monocular uh, depth estimation model on. The bottom part, is test data sets. Again, zero shot cross data set transfer. We test 
on data sets that were never seen at training time. In this project, we actually added a data set of our own to the mix. We contributed a data set of our own to the mix because we saw an opportunity to introduce very interesting data for training monocular depth estimation models that was quite complementary uh, to other data sets that we found uh, in the literature. Our data comes from 3D movies. We presented a uh, methodology for creating uh, training data for monocular depth estimation models from 3D movies. And you can find the details in the paper and you can reproduce our data set yourself uh, using scripts that are open source and available to the public. So uh, there are scripts in the, in, the, in the public domain that allow you to recreate this data set and uh, use it yourself. So the key ideas in our work were first of all, uh, operationalizing this protocol of data set mixing and cross data set transfer for monocular depth estimation. We present a clear reproducible, rigorous evaluation protocol that designates a, a, a specific number of, uh, a specific set of data sets for training, a specific set of data sets for testing, and presents a clear protocol for evaluating zero shot cross data set transfer in uh, this domain. We contribute the 3D movies data set, which can be reproduced by anybody with open source scripts that are available uh, to the public. We contribute a number of uh, technical ideas that we have shown to be quite helpful, such as robust losses uh, that allow you to effectively combine supervision for monocular depth estimation from different data sets uh, that may have been acquired with different sensors, with different statistics, uh, and a different data collection uh, procedures. We formulate data set mixing as multi-objective optimization inspired by uh, work in uh, multitask learning. And we present extensive experiments that clearly demonstrate unprecedented performance in this domain. And this is what I want to show you in the next few minutes. On this slide, what you will see are the results of our model, which we call MIDAS, on clips from the Davis data set. So on the right, you will see the depth maps produced by the MIDAS model for images that you see on the left. Again, there is some temporal instability because again, these are processed not as video, but as images. Each frame, each time step is processed independently. Uh, but I hope you can appreciate that the depth maps on the right look quite plausible. Hello, today I will present some recent work towards machines that see in the real world. not as video, but as images. Each frame, each time step is processed independently. Uh, but I hope you can appreciate that the depth maps on the right look quite plausible. And this is zero shot cross data set transfer. This data was never seen during training. In fact, the Davis data set, the data set of these clips, is not a data set for monocular depth estimation at all. It does not provide any supervision uh, for uh, this task. It is simply a data set of uh, very complex, realistic, diverse uh, video clips.
Here are quantitative results. What you see here are comparisons of our model in the top row, the Midas model, to state-of-the-art monocular depth estimation models. So the top half of this table lists models that did not see test data sets during training. So the data sets that we designated for testing for zero shot cross data set transfer were also not seen by these uh, models in the top part of uh, the table. So the top part of the table presents a fair comparison of models that did not see any of the test data sets during training. The bottom part uh, lists models that did train on the test data sets. And what you see, interestingly enough, is that some of the models in the bottom part that do train on test data sets can, in effect, overfit to individual test data sets. So uh, a model that trains specifically on the Kitty data set can get really excellent performance on the Kitty data set, but it loses tremendously on other data sets because it, in effect, overfits to a single data set. Likewise, this model that trains on the NYU data set gets excellent performance on the NYU data set, but loses a lot on other data sets. You can see a summary of the performance across data sets in the rightmost column, which is the rank. The rank is a robust measure of performance across data sets. Rank one means that a model is the best on every single data set. So our model gets rank 1.8. The closest prior model has a rank of 4.7, a big, big gap. Here is another view of the same data. Here we list the performance drop, the error increase across data sets in relative terms of prior state-of-the-art models relative to our model. Here, the units are percentage increase in error. So in each data set, there is its own performance measure. They're on different scales and they're not really comparable across data set. But within each data set, there is an error measure and lower is better. So when you see here, let's say a number like minus 100, Minus 100 means that a baseline has double the error, an error of 2x relative to our model. So if our model has error 12, minus 100 means that the baseline has error of 24. Look at the mean here. Across data set, the average increase in error. The best prior model has an average increase in error of 65%. It is 65% worse than our uh, model. Let's take a look at some more results. This is a uh, cross, uh, zero shot cross data set transferred to the DIW data set, a very nice diverse data set of challenging images. And you see here the results of our model Again, uh, the data was not seen at all uh, during uh, training. Uh, we did not train at all uh, on the DIW images. Here are results on paintings and drawings. This was pointed out to us by Aaron Hertzman, who tried our model on paintings and drawings and did not expect it to work, but found to his surprise that it did. We were just as surprised as he was. We never even tried. It didn't even occur to us to try, but after he alerted us to this, we did try, and turns out the model works reasonably well on paintings and uh, drawings. We've never seen uh, such performance before in monocular depth estimation. And of course, with monocular depth estimation, it is a very important to sanity check uh, and look at the results in 3D because uh, these depth maps, if they're very good, they should actually look 
like coherent 3D scenes if you look at them in 3D. And you can see this at the bottom row here. These are scenes from the Microsoft Cocoa data set, not seen at all during training. Again, this is zero shot cross data set transfer. What you see at the bottom are the depth maps rendered as 3D point sets with perspective. And you can see that they look like fairly coherent 3D scenes. So to summarize, uh, we began today's talk by uh, ascertaining that computer vision does matter. Explicit computer vision, which produces intermediate representations, helps train sensory motor systems that train faster and generalize better. The frontier for uh, explicit computer vision that produces such useful intermediate representations is generality and robustness. It is our responsibility to train computer vision models that function out of the box in diverse natural environments with no prior exposure to these environments. We introduced a clear methodology for approaching such robustness, which is to mix diverse data sets during training and to test via zero shot cross data set transfer, which is as good a proxy measure as I have seen so far for performance in new environments in the real world. And as an outcome of these projects, we have now excellent models for semantic segmentation and monocular depth estimation that you can download from these repositories. And these models work out of the box. They're not perfect. We have not reached perfection yet. We are not done yet. But these are the best models I have seen for semantic segmentation and monocular depth estimation in diverse natural environments that were not seen at all during training. If I were to take one model, one semantic segmentation model, or one monocular depth estimation with me to a trip to Alaska or Myanmar, I would take these models. I hope you try them, and I hope these prove useful to you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Vladen. So it's a great talk. And um, I want to mention that we are about 800 people watching this broadcast. And uh, don't be shy to ask questions. So we have a chat below where you can ask questions to speakers during the talk or for discussions later on. Uh, so it's my great speaker to introduce our uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Jitendra Malik. Jitendra is a uh, professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering in uh, Berkeley, and also a, a research director of Facebook AI in uh, Milan Park. And um, Jitendra is probably one of the most known people in computer vision, uh, who has done pro really profound contributions in uh, computer vision, com com computational modeling of biological vision, computer graphics, and machine learning. And uh, he has many distinctions but probably uh, the highest distinction are the terms which came into computer vision with Jitendra, and uh, they are staying there because uh, and becoming classical terms such as uh, anisotropic diffusion, normalized cuts, shape context, and more recently are cement. Uh, so, and also uh, Jitendra has been uh, one of the people who really pushed the uh, computer vision into deep learning error by um, 
um, suggesting people who are working on neural networks to run their methods on the ImageNet. And that's where the all the neural network and CNN revolution started in computer vision recently. So we are very happy to have Jitendra here with us today. And uh, Jitendra is giving a live talk. So please welcome Jitendra. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm really sorry that I'm not in Moscow. I was looking forward to that, but uh, these are the times and that's how it should be. So uh, my talk is about learning to see people and objects in 3D. And uh, I want to start with this uh, background slide. This is a slide I presented at a computer vision conference in 2012, where I was arguing that the there are three main families of problems in computer vision. Uh, recognition problems, so these are naming objects, dinosaur, pair, et cetera. There are reconstruction problems, so you can think of these as inverse graphics, so recovering geometrical and various other properties of the physical world, so that's on the bottom left, and reorganization, which sometimes people call grouping or segmentation. And this is essentially identifying the set of pixels that belong together. And my argument was, and this was in the era just before deep learning, took off that all these processes are connected to each other. They all have a very close interplay. So that's why there are these bi-directional arrows. And in fact, we are going to get success only by combining these. So the first part of that linkage, which really happened pretty soon after the deep learning revolution, was this connection between recognition and reorganization. And I want to show that off by some of the results from the latest in the RCNN family of approaches. This is called Mask RCNN, and this is work uh, from uh, Facebook AI research. And here what you have are objects which have been detected as well as segmented out. So the colors here correspond to the pixels of an individual object. And this is, in my view, truly impressive because 10 years ago, in 2010, if we had this discussion, I would not have thought that we would get results of this quality. And here's another slide which shows the kinds of accomplishments of our best deep learning techniques are today. So all these small objects are being found and so on and so forth. So what's missing? I think what's missing is 3D. We have these objects, but these are all in flatland. These are bunches of pixels in flatland. But the world consists of objects arranged in three-dimensional space. So that's where we need to go next. So that's the future. We initially were happy with just putting bounding boxes around objects. Then we moved to the stage of finding pixel masks. But now the future is in 3D. We should see these, these pixels as arising from objects in three dimensions arranged in some three-dimensional space. And I think that we are in the early days for that. But in the next few, few years, I think we will make significant progress. So the goals here are to recognize everything and understand its shape, detailed understanding of semantics and geometry. And this will inevitably involve cross-coupling with uh, recognition and grouping. I want to start by recapping some of the old classic ideas in, in 3D vision. And com uh, computer vision is a field which started in the 1960s. And the earliest paper there uh, is uh, so-called uh, Roberts' thesis that's on the top left, the so-called Bloch's world example. So this is 1963. So we are talking about like 60 years ago, practically. And what he said was that we can interpret an image if we know what kinds of objects could be in the image. So if you know that you might be looking at a rectangular solid, then what you see in the image, you interpret as that object from a certain camera viewpoint. And then we, so we can solve the inverse problem that way. Now this is true, not just of rectangular or ge simple geometric shapes, but even of complex shapes like human faces. So on the right, I show you this work called Morphable Models. This is work from Blanz and Wetter somewhere around 1999. And what they showed was that we can have, we have a very deep understanding of faces and the typical 3D shape of a face. And given that from a single image, we can interpret uh, what is going on and make guesses about the 3D. Uh, at the bottom, we have techniques which are called 
generic techniques because they don't require knowledge of particular object categories. So shape from shading, this was looking at the information in brightness patterns and then structure from motion, where generally the idea is that you have multiple views of a scene. And uh, once you can solve for correspondences, you can do triangulation. And uh, this is the same idea as uh, was studied in the field of photogrammetry. So this is work which has gone on for the last 50, 60 years. And the task for us right now is, can we fruitfully combine these ideas with ideas from learning, machine learning, deep learning? Can we bring them together? And the answer is yes. And the purpose of my talk is largely to take you through some examples of that. So I'm going to start with Mesh RCNN. This is a paper we presented at ICCV 2019. And as you can see, the, it builds off R, the RCNN family of approaches, which were originally designed first for ob detecting objects, putting bounding boxes around them, and after that to put uh, get the masks, the set of pixels which belong to an object. But what we do here is more. So suppose we are given this input image, then our goal is to get 3D meshes. Well, meshes are the entities that computer graphics people like. So once they have a mesh, they can texture map it, they can render it, they can rotate it, they can translate it. So you can use all the tricks of computer graphics. So how do we go from an image to these 3D meshes? So that's the goal of the mesh RCNN work. We're going to do it in stages. So the first stage is 2D object recognition. So the basic setup of uh, RCNN, which is you put bounding boxes around objects and you label them. This is a sofa, this is a chair, and we even know the pixels corresponding to this. And then we have a next stage, which is going to be voxelization. So we are going to find the voxel. So think of this as like little Lego blocks. So little cubes, which you have put together and that's how we have constructed the object. And from that, we are going to get to 3D meshes. So the goal is going to be to train a neural network which can accomplish this. And in fact, it's going to go through these stages. And this is going to be a supervised learning problem. So we are going to be given pairs where we are start, we are given the input image and we are given the mesh that we desire to obtain. And we are going to train a network to do this. So what's the architecture of this network? So that's what uh, this overview slide is. And let me take you through the steps. So the top, uh, let me do it in stages. So we start off with a, 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 a branch which is basically standard RCNN. So uh, a, a standard mask RCNN. So you have, you have the image, you have this so-called RO align operation, uh, which is finding uh, sort of the features associated with certain uh, rectangular regions. And then from that, we can train a predictor for the 2D mask, the box, the class, et cetera. Now we add an extra branch and this branch is going to do the 3D work for us. And this is going to try to predict the voxels, okay? And once we have the voxels, we have this sort of cubifying operator, which gives us this cubified mesh. And as you look at it, you can see that this is kind of looking like something you would build out of Lego blocks. And what this does is that, and of course it doesn't look smooth and it's going to be low res. Why? Let's think about that. See, voxels are a very good and simple and easy representation, but they have this problem that the complexity grows as they're cubed, right? Because uh, uh, dimension, if there's a length dimension, then uh, cubes L cubed. So what that means is that essentially it's very difficult to have uh, cubes which are beyond 32 by 32 by 32. So 32 cubed is already a pretty big number. And at some point you start running out of memory in your GPU and so on and so forth. So voxelized reconstructions are always land up being low res, but it's very easy to deal with uh, objects of different kinds of topology. So whether you have uh, different kinds of genus, is this a uh, is this a sphere? Is it a cup with one handle, et cetera, et cetera? All of those can be dealt with very naturally. Once you have that cubified mesh, so that's your 3D representation, then what we are going to do is to refine this. And the way we refine this is, of course, always by connecting back to the raw image data. 
So there's this vertex aligned operation. And what that is doing is connecting back to the features from the image. So imagine some high dimensional vector which corresponds to the different channels and you have that at every location. And this vert align operation is uh, trying to con connect the two. After this, what we are going to do is to do computations on this mesh. And the goal of those computations are to refine the mesh, making use of the precise image data that we have, the pixel brightness values. So the topology that we have to now deal with is no longer a grid, no longer a simple 2D grid that you can do convolutions. We now have a graph, right? This is a mesh which is in three dimensions. It has vertices and faces and edges and so forth. So the right setup now becomes graph convolution. And uh, if uh, you haven't studied that topic, I mean, it, it's something worth studying if you're interested in continuing in, in, in deep learning that has lots of applications. So what we now need to do is graph convolution operations by which essentially information is going to flow uh, from different nodes of the mesh to other nodes of the mesh in some local way. So it's really the counterpart of convolution on the image pixel grid. And uh, so that will cause the vertices of the mesh to move. So effectively, we are making it sort of nicer and smoother, but being consistent with the image data. And that's what you see in this bottom mesh refinement branch. And you can repeat this a few times and in order to get the final mesh. And here are some results on ShapeNet. So let me show you, tell you what ShapeNet is. So ShapeNet is out of Stanford. This is a, a collection of CAD models of objects. So there are lots of CAD models of chairs and cars and airplanes in there. So we use this as our source of ground truth because we have images which we can get by rendering these objects. And then we want to connect uh, we, from those images, we want to predict the 3D mesh. And that's what we do. And uh, there are other approaches uh, for this, of course. And uh, here's another example. And uh, what's cool about this example is that you can see that the objects being reconstructed can have different genus. It doesn't only have to have topology homeomorphic to a sphere. And uh, then, uh, then finally, we can back this up with numbers. So the idea is that you have this reconstructed shape and you need to have a, uh, an, a loss function which matches the, this reconstructed shape to the desired shape. And it can be done with something called chamfer distance. So the idea is that you sample points on both the shapes and then you find the nearest point and then you, you sort of average those together. And... Uh, uh, so here are some more results. I, the numbers are always good, otherwise the paper wouldn't be accepted. But uh, here are some reconstructions. And the point here is to show that we can handle complex scenes. So these objects are not in isolation. They are not like product shots of a single object on a white background, uh, but yet this technique does a good re job of reconstructing them. And the challenging aspects here are reconstructing fine structures. And those are challenging for both 2D recognition and 3D reconstruction. So let me uh, uh, sort of make some concluding remarks on this mesh RCNN work. I mean, this approach works. It's probably the leading approach out there for trying to do these uh, reconstructions of 3D objects, but the, it requires what I would call unnatural supervision. It, what we needed to train such a model were 3D CAD models of the objects. And we needed this at training time. At test time, you can just have images. Now this is artificial because if you think about a child, as a child is growing up and learning how to see the world in 3D, the child does not have CAD models and certainly doesn't have CAD models injecting into his, into his or her head. So uh, how is the child getting the supervision? The child is getting the supervision by interacting with objects and observing objects, by seeing objects from multiple viewpoints, which enables the stereo system to, or structure for motion system to go into a supervision. So I think that's the future. I think ShapeNet has been very helpful to us for the last four or five years, but I think it's probably time that we should be retiring it and trying to move to natural modes of supervision. So let me show you how we might do that. 
So this is a, I'll show you a couple of pieces of work and here is a paper from uh, ECCB 2018. So we decided to tackle a category where uh, birds. So we wanted to build 3D models of birds. And uh, why is this challenging? Because birds, we don't have CAD models for birds and we cannot capture birds and put them into a 3D scanner either. So the info, but humans are very good, how do, but we have a good sense of 3D shape of a bird. How do we have that? We have that just from 2D views, right? So what we wanted to do was to see, can we build an approach which is just from 2D views, no CAD models necessary. So what we did was, okay, so you have photographs of birds and this is easy to get. Lots of people go around taking pictures of birds. And we provide, decided to give a little bit of help to the system. So uh, by providing key points. So these key points are like uh, the beak and some the tail or, or whatever. So you can see these are semantically defined key points. So this is kind of supervision, right? Trying to provide some uh, little bit of assistance to the system, but semantic. And then of course the mask, the, what are the pixels corresponding to the bird? but there is no 3D CAD model. Now, what we did was that we developed an approach. Uh, this is what we call the category specific mesh recovery. And uh, uh, from this object, what we are able to do is to recover its 3D model. And I can show that off by showing uh, the view from different viewpoints. So how, do we, how can we do this? So we are only gonna have 2D views. There's no CAD model. So therefore the stand, straightforward way of training doesn't work. So the paradigm that we have to use is what is sometimes called analysis by synthesis, or we can think of it as somewhat related to the concept of generative models. So the idea is here is this image and I need a function F, which is going to reconstruct these three uh, uh, attributes, the shape, the 3D shape, the mesh, the camera and the texture. And I don't know any of them, okay? What do I know? What I know is that they combined together should give rise to the image, right? So what we have to do is to have some loss function which says enforces that the reprojection is correct. And then we might have constraints like the smoothness of the shape or something on the texture, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basic paradigm and uh, I'm going to skip the details, but, but that's the big idea. Try to guess what shape, camera, and texture could give rise to the image. And it, the, this technique actually does work. And uh, we are able to do these reconstructions. But in this work, uh, a major weakness was that we were had to supply key points by hand. And that is a limitation, right? Because you really don't want to do that. I, told you that the main enterprise that we want to go through in this 3D business is getting out of this kind of artificial supervision with CAD models. So we got rid of that supervision, but we put in needed uh, key points. So th this is the more recent work from our group, which shows that we can actually manage to get rid of the key points. And uh, uh, so we call this paper uh, UCMR, unsupervised CMR. And it's the same, uh, we, I love birds, so we'll continue to work with birds. And the goal here is to predict 3D shape, camera, texture, object from single image using just the images and the silhouettes. The silhouettes could potentially be computed by the mask RCNN system. No 3D ground shape, no cameras, no key points. In fact, this problem is more challenging than the standard structure from motion problem in computer vision because here you have multiple views, but they are multiple views of different birds. See in structure from motion or stereo, you have multiple views of the same object. Here, there are multiple views of different instances. So what you have to rely on is some kind of broad family resemblance, some kind of a deformable shape template. So how do we do this? So what we found was that to make this optimization work, so the philosophy remains analysis by synthesis, try to find the shape, the camera, and uh, the texture, which will reconstruct the, the, the image. But when we tried it in the straightforward way, it just didn't work. The optimization didn't work. And as you know, 
neural network optimization is non-convex, so there are no guarantees. So they, one of the big excitement about deep learning was that even though it was a non-convex problem, in practice it worked. And uh, there is a, there's still something being studied mathematically as to why this is so, but a big part of the answer is over-parameterization. We operate in a much bigger space. So if you take that, so we tried to take that idea and it turns out that basically trying to reconstruct the camera directly was what was getting us into trouble. And what we did instead was to say, let's maintain what we call a camera multiplex. So you have a bunch of hypotheses for camera. So maybe 40 possible hypotheses. And instead of uh, uh, picking a single camera, you determine the weights on all these different hypotheses during that optimization process. So that makes the optimization process much friendlier. And then what, after that, eventually, once you've learned what works, then actually you can tra train a, a feed forward model for that camera predictor. And then the rest is uh, more or less the analysis by synthesis paradigm. And then here we show some results where these are, all you have is a single image of the object. And here we have shown the reconstruction of the shape and the texture. Note underlying in both the work on mesh RCNN and this uh, work on which we call CMR or UCMR is some underlying technology for differentiable rendering. And again, I've not got into the details, but look that term up because effectively what you have to do is you need to have um, deep learning is really about connecting parameterized modules and then training them with gradient descent. And what that needs is that you need to be able to compute derivatives. And if you can compute derivatives, then the approach applies. So how do we have derivatives through the rendering pipeline? And that's the whole uh, challenge of differentiable rendering. Some more results. And now uh, in my remaining 10 minutes, I'm going to focus on uh, not objects, but a special object, which is people. And this is work on end-to-end uh, -end recovery of human shape, shape and pose with uh, Anju Kanazawa, Michael Black, David, and David Jacobs. So what's the problem we are trying to deal with? The problem is that we want to recover 3D models of people. So how should we have 3D models of people? So there is a, this parameterized approach called simple, where you have some parameters beta which correspond to the shape of the person. Is this a fat person, thin person, tall person, that kind of thing. And then you have parameters corresponding to the pose, which are the degrees of freedom of the different joints of the person. So you might have like a total of 80 degrees of freedom. And then of course the camera. So the whole problem is going to be, we are going to start with some people in an image. So there's a person, so you have some pixels for the person. And we want to estimate these like 80 parameters corresponding to the shape, the pose, and the camera. And increasingly, all the problems in computer vision are really about how do we deal with, uh, how do we design good supervision techniques? Because the easy stuff, you know, where you could have labels from ImageNet or Coco, that's all been done. The challenge in the future is always going to be how to manage with self-supervision or weak supervision. So the challenge we had here was that there are tons and tons of images of people. We can even have lots of images and label key points like elbow, shoulder, et cetera, because humans can mark those. What's hard is uh, paired 3D to 2D data, because how do you get 3D data for humans? You put them into a scanner, but you, you see these people who are outside running, you don't have them in the scanner at that time. You don't gonna, you're not gonna have paired 2D to 3D data. So, Again, the philosophy is again going to be analysis by synthesis, try to guess the shape and pose and so forth, which gives rise to what you see in the image. But the challenge is we don't have uh, 3D data. We can collect 3D data in the lab. We can bring people to a lab and then ca capture, do a motion capture or so on. But it's going to be very limited and it's not going to be paired. So the the philosophy that we used was the following. We must explain the 2D. So there is going to be some reprojection loss kind of thing. And what we need to do is to use the 3D scans to build some model of what people look like. So it defines a distribution. So if you are, want to be a Bayesian, this is kind of the prior on the shape and joint angles of humans. 
and you recover that and then you have a kind of the data term which comes from the pixels. So, so we start from an image, we are trying to do a prediction, this is a regression to, for the, all those parameters. And we are trying to guess the camera, the shape and the pose. And of course the test is, does it give rise to the right projections of the key points, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, same basic idea as we saw previously with birds. But here is the additional idea. The additional idea is, is this like the picture of a human? And that's for that you have a, you train a discriminator. And you try to do a reconstruction, which is in the space of humans. And I'll show you some examples. So here's the kind of human 3D mesh recovery that we can get with this paradigm. And uh, even we can even find parts. And uh, now uh, let me turn to uh, what can we do if we have, uh, if, if we have video because normally we are going to have not just a single image, but we can, we have video. And here, um, this is work with uh, Anju, Jason and Pana. Uh, what we want to do is to learn the human dynamics. How do people walk? How do people run? How do people jump? How do they play tennis? Okay, so it's now we are moving into the spatio-temporal category. So the basic idea is that we have a previous model which works for single frames. So it, uh, so it, it does this, uh, uh, let's call this little phi t. And we, what we want to do is to build up a representation which we call a movie strip, which is kind of this representation over time. Okay, now this is an embedding. So you think of this as an embedding of a spatiotemporal chunk of a person. Now what's the, the value of this embedding? How do we train this embedding? We train it by making sure that it makes the right predictions. So this is similar to what has been done in language. So you have these models like BERT, for example, which are trying to predict future words, missing words, et cetera. So the same kind of ideas, but uh, now for predicting 3D shape instead. And uh, so that's what we are trying to do. So that's where the loss will be, try the, the predictions there. And, uh, and anyway, that's the core idea, the details you can look up. But what this will enable us to do is uh, to do uh, 3D reconstructions of the shape and pose of the person over time. And so temporal smoothness is going to get built in automatically. This is like the counterpart of language models. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll now show you this uh, example where what we tried to do was to really take this analogy to language models and try to predict what will come in the future. So for this, you need to do autoregressive prediction. So you start from some input video and uh, that's the ground truth. And what we try to do is to predict the future. So we have seen the segment of the video from, uh, from in the past up to the present time. And now I have to predict what will happen in the future. So this is just like the, uh, the, the dog ran after the and then there's a blank and you want to, maybe you will fill in cat. So that's what we are gonna do, except that we are gonna fill in this 3D shape here. And I'm going to have a little, uh, uh, a little video clip, which will go through, which will uh, summarize this approach. In this work, we present an approach that takes a video of a person as input and predicts the future 3D mesh sequence of the person. Here, we show the ground truth future video for reference but the model only sees the input video. To do this, we propose a neural autoregressive prediction model on the latent representation of 3D human motion encoded from the video. This allows seamless transition between conditioning on the past image frames and conditioning on previously generated future predictions. Specifically, for each image frame, we first extract a per image feature vector. From these image features, we learn a latent representation of human dynamics which we refer to as a movie strip. Each movie strip is causal, which means that it only contains information about the frames up to the current time step in consideration. We then train a 3D regressor that predicts the parameters of the 3D mesh model from the movie strip representation. This is trained with 3D supervision when available. And if not, the model can be trained with 2D key point reprojection loss, along with an adversarial prior to ensure the poses look realistic. In order to predict into the future, 
we train an autoregressive model, which is a temporal convolutional network that uses the past movie strip representations to predict the next movie strip. This newly predicted movie strip then becomes one of the inputs to the next frame prediction, which may continue repeatedly in succession. From the predicted future movie strip sequences, we can also read out the 3D mesh parameters. This autoregressive model is trained with the same losses where the predicted 3D mesh model has to match the ground truth 3D or 2D joint labels along with the prior. We also include an additional distillation loss, which guides the autoregressive model to predict the actual movie strip representation. Alternatively, we can also apply the autoregressive model directly on the predicted 3D mesh model. Here, we show some qualitative results. Our approach can predict the future 3D motion of non-periodic actions such as boring. The yellow mesh is read out directly from the Grand Truth movie strips, while the blue mesh is the predicted output of our model. Due to computational constraints, we only train our model to predict up to 25 future frames. But in these sequences, we show the predictions are reasonable even past 25 frames. Yeah, so this is just more examples. So I want to conclude here by, uh, by listing at least one application of, uh, of this work, which is that if we can detect and track people in 3D, this can give us something which is very helpful for robotics because in robotics uh, the task of learning different uh, kinds of actions manipulation navigation these skills like uh, cartwheels and so forth has proved to be very challenging for vanilla reinforcement learning algorithms but what uh, we can do is we can learn from humans so we can take video clips of humans and use that to provide a reference motion which provides a rich no longer sparse training signal for training a, a policy. And uh, I have a citation here to a paper. And let me conclude here with uh, very wise words from Alan Turing. The world of 3D is, is I think, world, a world where we have made good progress and there's a lot more to be done. We can see, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tendra. So this is an excellent Thank talk. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, stop share now. Right. So uh, we are now at the discussion phase. And uh, I guess both Deva and Cordelia and uh, Vlad Lem are all here. Right. OK, great. Yeah, so, so we had uh, uh, four interesting talks uh, touched uh, different areas in computer vision machine learning. Um, and uh, we have some questions from audience, uh, some specific questions, some a bit more general. Uh, maybe I wanted to start with a general comment, which uh, just came up to me when I was listening to all the talks is um, that, uh, so in the last 10 years, say the deep learning has, so the, uh, the computer vision has um, really improved. Uh, so one would expect maybe that uh, some problems are solved and uh, we go with the next problems, but uh, it seems that uh, the number of problems just increases. We are still working on low level vision, shape, motion, uh, but we are also looking at uh, agents and robots. And, uh, uh, and, we all, and now we also want to solve all of it uh, all together. So before when we had lots of people working on different things, now it seems we all want to solve it together. So uh, yeah, I don't know what's, what's the question here, but uh, so it seems that like we are increasing the complexity and uh, maybe it's because there are more people working in computer vision than ever now. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts, how are we going to deal with this complexity? Is it too much or is it necessary to to address the task because it's all end to end and should be addressed jointly. I know if uh, who wants to. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll make one remark. Uh, so it is that I think 
that the grand dream of computer vision people or AI people has always been that we should have modules which can be put together to solve any new task. I mean, that's just a general computer science thing, right? You have pieces of software that you can put together. And there were designs of, you know, there was this image understanding environment back in the 90s and so on. And those generally failed because the modules were simply not good enough. And if you have a bunch of junk, you put it together, it's still junk. So what, what we now have is uh, stuff that actually works. It doesn't work perfectly. I think there are many problems we can't solve yet. Like I think problems where we have problems which are in the long tail, so you don't have enough training data, et cetera, et cetera. I think those are real problems, but we have enough stuff that industry uh, finds the output of computer vision useful. And there are many real, real, many real applications. I think what's going to happen further is, uh, I think actually a more a greater emphasis on modularity, because I think that the current style of uh, training everything end to end for a specific task, we cannot necessarily afford that across the board for a very, very large number of applications. So we need to have modules. And uh, I think our modules will keep getting better, but we do will need to have modules. Any other, anybody else on this, thoughts on this? I was wondering, so yeah, yes, modularity is, uh, uh, is what, uh, as engineers, that's a very logical thought. Uh, same time when uh, I talk to, uh, People from neural networks, like uh, uh, um, so, they, they are thinking of neural network as one thing. So you, you cannot decompose. It's like would be taking your brain out, like put piece of the brain out, and uh, trying to do something with it. So which is, um, yeah, we cannot see one like part of out of the whole thing. Uh, but may, maybe still, if the modularity is a interest is a good approach. So the question: What are the um, what are the intermediate tasks we should put to the system so that uh, when we train it, then uh, we can help, we can hope that they will uh, help the uh, final tasks. So, so is, is there a danger that we will design a task which, uh, uh, which actually won't lead us where we want because we design it manually? Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in with, with a, a comment here. Um, <clears throat> so, so one thing that, that I've seen in terms of like whether whether we've uh, if we if we come up with manual tasks in terms of um, answering the question, uh, how do we know that we have the right tasks? Uh, so, something that I have seen is just from at least from my own time in recent history, getting exposed to um, vision for let's say self-driving vehicles and autonomous navigation, is that it does seem like the tasks that seem relevant there seem to be different than the ones that I've seen emphasized in computer vision. Um, so uh, there I'm, I'm, I'm seeing things that are much more to address Jacinder's comment about uh, long tails, um, things that I would, sometimes I, I like using the term open world. So can you identify um, that there's an, uh, an object there without naming it? Um, and so right now, a lot of the recognition tasks that we, uh, that we sort of uh, focus on tend to be very, fairly high level, um, but uh, sort of like classic computer vision, you know, like low level vision of shape and geometry uh, tended to be almost uh, more generic and capable of almost generalization by construction because it's answering much more low, low level questions. I don't have to have seen this particular um, uh, make and model of a car before in order to recognize it. Um, so, so I feel like sort of low level vision including more, um, uh, so that's one aspect, at least for, for me personally, I haven't seen as much emphasis on, but um, in our field, but it seems like when we hook it up to these other downstream modules that plan and act, th those seem to be really important. And then the other one, the other form of that is some sort of um, sort of like motion or tracking. It seems like that's really a, a fundamental substrate about understanding how the world evolves. And somehow that hasn't been, uh, uh, Sort of emphasize as much as, as let's say other other high level tasks. Um, so, so from my perspective, 
um, a lot of times hooking up to these um, uh, sort of end applications can help us answer the question you just asked, you know, what are the right tasks? Actually, I have a question from audience, which may be like, uh, which may be related actually to the topic. So it's uh, from uh, Abe Sapru. So he's asking in a country which is overly populated, like India, where where there are, there's a heavy and congested traffic and driving. Uh, it's a cat is also not good and kind of random. How effective would be autonomous driving there, and how would, would it behave in harsh weather conditions? So maybe. Like linking it to what we are talking about, like what would be the tasks, like what, what, how should we define the task to such that then we make a system which finally gets to India or some other countries that are with the harsh conditions driving and make it work? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have sort of a, a great answer for that. It could just be that it's still some, somewhat like the task we talked about before, like detecting objects, tracking them, understanding geometry, being able to forecast how things. Uh, will behave in the future, doing all that stuff, but now making sure that the sort of data that we analyze is sufficiently diverse. So we throw adverse weather conditions in and scenes that are extremely dense. Um, uh, and so I think about that as almost like a, uh, a difficulty with, um, so one question is whether or not we have the tools that can solve that, but in order to answer that question, it's, it's hard to even um, uh, kind of measure if we, if how, how bad we're doing or how good we're doing. And so in order to do that, we need to have like, I think really rich um, um, kind of like empirical sort of uh, environments and benchmarks that allow us to characterize um, how and when things fail. Um, so, so maybe the answer that I feel like we have sort of tasks that could uh, sort of hint at those, uh, um, the things we need to solve even for those conditions, but it's almost like getting the right diversity of data in those tasks. It seems, seems difficult and crucial. So I, I think this is actually a very important question. And my view is that we should actually be very hesitant to deploy autonomous driving systems at scale until they work in places like India. Because I think places like India with all the challenges that they present are indicative of real challenges that can arise in almost any environment in which autonomous systems coexist uh, with uh, human-driven vehicles, pedestrians, and all the complexity of the real world. So unless autonomous vehicles are given their own separate lanes, uh, like trams, for example, that essentially function according to different rules. Uh, unless that happens, a breakdown in etiquette and uh, an India-like situation can arise almost anywhere. And you encounter that in your own life, let's say once a year, uh, there is an unusual situation, somebody didn't see the light and, and, and ran a red light, perhaps by mistake, or there is a traffic accident and traffic is backlogged and everybody is improvising and lane boundaries are no longer respected. So there is a breakdown uh, in, uh, in etiquette. We're outside of, uh, of the norms and there's a very crowded, chaotic situation. You really don't want your autonomous vehicle to crash once a year. Crashing once a year when there is a breakdown in etiquette is not an acceptable behavior uh, for an autonomous, uh, autonomous vehicle. So situations that we consider extreme, we actually have to function essentially flawlessly in them because an extreme situation will happen, let's say once a year. A related point is that we as a community are not used to thinking of reliability uh, at the level of 99.999%. Uh, but that is actually what is expected of mission critical systems uh, like autonomous driving where people uh, are involved and people's lives are at stake. 
uh, in the computer vision and machine learning community, uh, the culture is such that when we get to 98% accuracy on any given standard benchmark and any given metric, we say, great, we're done. Time to move on for, uh, to a harder benchmark and a different problem. Somehow we're not equipped to drive systems to 99.999 percent accuracy and this will probably involve a shift in perspective uh, that we will need to make yeah totally agree. yeah so since you touched upon the benchmarking so it seems computer vision is more and more going to real world right? and, uh, so, uh, not only in cars and uh, robots but uh, in other places and the uh, question how do we how are we going to evaluate this because uh, evaluation of your world uh, well offline data sets yes you know uh, but we also know that uh, there's the long tail problem and uh, so there is a there's a question here on the chat also about the long tail problem and uh, yeah so how do we how are we going to be how are we going to uh ensure that uh, the system can run good in the real world, even if we cannot really test it in millions of cases in the real world. So is it a simulation? Is it the answer Maybe something else? I mean, simulation is part of the answer because if you think about how we train pilots, right? Or how do we train astronauts? We train them in simulation because uh, we train them for that incident which can occur once in a lifetime, which your just normal training will not encounter that, right? So there's, uh, and so simulation is in fact part of the answer for in terms of training humans. Uh, now the, the question of course is, is your simulator good enough in the sense that does it capture enough aspects of reality? So I think uh, that will always remain a challenge and uh, there's this line from George Box about statistical models, which is all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So all simulations are wrong, but some simulations are useful. I think uh, that would be my advice. The, the second aspect, which is not, I think, part of the question, but I want to say anyway, is that simulation enables us to deal with active perception settings or uh, you know, vision for guiding action like navigation or manipulation, which a static data set simply cannot do. So I think we have seen a fair degree of progress in simulators. I mean, in self-driving cars with simulators like Carla in the context of sort of uh, 3D environments, uh, Gibson, Habitat, and so on. And I do believe that this is a very promising line. Right. So simulators, the model of reality, and, uh... So when we train agents, so we need them to uh, to see if the actions which the agent performs actually leads to yeah, yeah predicted uh, behavior. And so here maybe there's some connection to work which Kodele talked about today about the anticipation of actions. And uh, so we know it's a hard topic. It's uh, of course many things can happen. It's not really a one answer. It's a distribution. Uh, so, uh, how to build models of uh, of uh, anticipating actions? So, in terms of simulators, so if you want to run a make a simulator of uh, human behavior, so could Elia maybe have any ideas how to how yeah. this could be done? Yeah, I'm not sure I would go with a simulator actually because you have quite a lot of your data, right? So I guess, I mean, what you don't have in real data, maybe you don't have the extreme conditions. So maybe you could start with real data and then like expand on it or kind of augment it to have more of these difficult conditions. But I think like what we found is actually that there's a lot of this, this real data. What's important is actually to find difficult examples, right? So basically maybe if you have this Indian setup, I would just say let's have a car drive around India or whatever and then kind of mine the difficult cases and then train on them or maybe generate more of those difficult cases. 
So it's actually very important. So a lot of the self-driving car environments, you have like this straight driving behavior, which is absolutely not meaningful for training. But if you mind the really difficult cases, you can get a much better set of training examples. And in general, I think, I mean, simulated data, we have seen it is for robotics. It's good, but it's not good enough, right? So I think you can kind of develop your systems on it. But for, for real world testing, I think you just need to drive around with your car and see what are failure modes. And then one thing I think which would be important is to have kind of some uncertainty measures and some predictability, right? So for example, for the uncertainty, for the behavior prediction, one thing which we're not doing, we're not having confidence in, right? But you could imagine that there's not one specific prediction trajectory, but there are many trajectories, right? So you could really say what kind of confidence you have and then add this confidence into your system and also have some feedback loop, right? And what these things don't do either, I mean, basically you could drive around with them. And so for example, my favorite example is my car always breaks at the, the end the, the, the entry and the exit of India. So it just breaks even if the door is open. And this is like it's kind of a, it's kind of very funny. It's a reproducible failure mode, and what would be nice is to understand why it does it, like even for the user, and then also to teach the system that this is incorrect, right? And these things, I think, they're completely missing some kind of feedback loop and something where you understand what's going on. I guess some of the people do it, but for the research people, they're not really looking into all these failure modes, and I think that that will be more and more important. And it's probably true for many vision applications to understand better why things are going wrong. So that also goes maybe to your, to your complete systems, right? In the end, you want to have something end-to-end -end trainable, but you want to have some ideas what the intermediate goals are and how, how well you do on them, right? For example, you could say you want to do the tracking and then the prediction, now everything is separate. You want to do it jointly, but you want to have some kind of measure of understanding what's going on, in particular for self-driving cars, right? You don't want to have everything end to end and then the thing that fails you want to have some explainability. Okay, I see. So it sounds like uh, simulating physics, flying, uh, running, uh, like uh, driving around or maybe touching, manipulating is good, but uh, simulate, simulating social behavior, this is too much. And uh, so this should be done by just data, by sampling and by data. This is the, the conclusion so far, or what do you think? Yeah, I would say yes, of course. I guess if you have enough data, you can simulate all the intermediate things as well, right? If you have seen enough things, probably you can also simulate similar behaviors. But I don't know. I would say for now, I would say simulation, simulated data is good for training, but for testing, I wouldn't like rely on this and on simulated data because that's also super dangerous. Because if you forget some cases or something go, goes wrong, then you cannot guarantee basically that you have of all cases, right? And I guess you can do this once you have this autonomous system, you can drive around for a long time and see what the failure modes are. Mm. It's not, I don't think it's completely impossible, but it's, it's difficult, right? So I have some one question from the audience. Alexei is asking Cordelia, if you know, may you share some information about the unsupervised approach in action definition? Which, do you know what he's precisely talking about? Which unsupervised? No. I, I mean, is it weakly supervised or is it completely unsupervised? Is it self supervised learning of features or? I guess it's unsupervised. I mean, it's kind of really, the question is quite open, right? So I would say completely unsupervised action definition is something which is really hard to do today. What people do do, they do self-supervised learning of features. So I don't know if he's referring to that or weekly supervised learning of actions that you have some kind of annotation. Like for example, you have some kind of noisy annotation and you use that to match the different actions or actions around sequences and use that to learn different actions. Right, so we're actually are going to have talks about uh, weekly supervised and unsu more weekly supervised action recognition tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, so it's another question about actions. Uh, so, thank you for very informative talk. Uh, 
which type of strategy, supervised, unsupervised, do you think uh, would work better for multiple future prediction tasks? Which strategy would work better? For multiple future prediction tasks. I mean, basically, if you have some kind of supervision, I mean, you can just use just the data by itself and use that for, to, to teach the supervision, right? Because you know what's going to come. So you have examples examples from which you have the supervision, right? So you can use that actually. So I'm not sure why anybody would use want to use completely unsupervised learning here. I mean, and maybe unsupervised in the sense that you don't annotate the future. Basically, you have your stream, you extract the trajectory up to some point, and then the prediction is done automatically. So that's actually what we do. We learn. We learn, you know, what the future frames are, but you know, learn the relations and the correlations over time automatically from the data, right? So you have actually, you have the, the subsequent frames, but you don't know where the actor is, you don't know how the interactions are, you don't know what exact model it is, you just learn that from the data, right? Thanks. I have one question to Jitendra. So, uh, uh, what are some of the approaches for assigning good pose shape priors for birds and humans? And how do you evaluate a prior if it's a good prior or bad prior? So, uh, yes, so the, I think you evaluate it by the end result. So, so uh, I mean, in the case of, uh, let's say that specifically the bird work, what we have is some kind of an initial shape template Okay, and uh, the test is that uh, uh, what kinds of predictions does it lead to for shapes? And there's a fair amount you can do with internal consistency of the data. Looking at that same object from different viewpoints is a very good uh, technique because if you look at the object from the same viewpoint, generally the reconstruction will always be good because the combination of shape and texture will do a good job. You have to always look at it from a different viewpoint. So in the case of humans, which is where these priors matter a lot because a lot of the data has 2D supervision. Again, the basic test is if you run it over time or over different viewpoints, then you will notice bizarre behavior. And that's your test uh, of uh, whether you, you, you reconstructed something good. Another question more to relate to geometry. So do you think uh, the mix of structure from motion and neural network can be mixed somehow if prior knowledge about forms, lines, and so on uh, in some domain specific task? Yeah, so I, I, think, I think the answer is yes. So I, in fact, what we are, I mean, I, there were some papers I didn't talk about where we have a paper called Learned Stereo Machine, which is trying to essentially do a reconstruction from multiple views of the same object. So uh, I think that uh, the answer is obviously yes, because the basic constraints of geometry, which are triangulation, for example, is the basic constraint from multiple views that uh, has to be utilized, obviously. I mean, uh, I think what what we may be able to get away from in the deep learning paradigm is a lot of the custom built hand engineered systems. So structure from motion is a field which has evolved over multiple decades. And it evolved in a time where we were working with discrete points rather than, uh, rather than images or layers of images. We were working with discrete points and we knew that many of the correspondences were going to be wrong. So how do you reconstruct in spite of that? So that's what led to you know, ideas like ransack and so forth. And so, and so that robustness of these systems led to a lot of heuristics which had to be put in, the desire for robustness. And when we, when we learn from data, in a sense, the data forces the robustness because you get a, if you have a huge amount of data, it has that variety. I don't have to think of all those weird cases and put in a heuristic for that. So I believe that philosophically, the, the underlying geometrical or physical cues are exactly the same. There is nothing new there in when we are doing this stuff with deep learning. I think that some of the superstructure of 
the heuristics which were added to provide robustness to the system, I think those hopefully we can shed. In fact, it, I think it, the system will become prettier because the underlying basic beauty of the mathematics comes through more clearly once you get rid of all this superstructure of heuristics. Yes. So, but are there, is there evidence that so machine learning has penetrated computer vision for a long time, but there's uh, not so much uh, marriage between the classical geometry and uh, computer vision? I, I think there's a marriage between geometry and deep learning. I wouldn't, uh, the term classical is subject to interpretation. I think, uh, like almost all the things that I talked about, I, I regard them as being a mixture of geometry and deep learning because analysis by synthesis, right? You're predicting the pixels based on the geometry. In uh, classical computer vision, we used to call this a reprojection error. Okay, and it was for a set of points, but it's exactly the same concept. I think that concepts are exactly the same. Yeah, just referring to discussion, which we have here in our lab for uh, Rijal and with other people that uh, if you're, so it's more related to uh, robotics now and how do you like motion planning and, and uh, or even like learning physics. And there's a question, why should you learn physics? Because it has been invented for hundreds of years. And if you fail to integrate uh, physics and you learn it, it means you have failed because you, uh, yeah, you're just not taking advantage of all the knowledge which people have built before. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a question, should we relearn geometry? Should we relearn what people have done in robotics for the last 20 years about motion planning? Uh, should we relearn Newton laws by data? So is it, a, it seems there are two views, like one more orthodox uh, and one more uh, just go with whatever works better. Yeah, I, I think that there's a continuum here and there is a, a one extreme philosophical viewpoint, which maybe someone like Jan Lekun would represent, which would be that let's try to, uh, because he believes that essentially the, since the structure of the cortex is the same everywhere, that the right learning engine could learn everything. And so that's an aesthetic judgment that that's the point, which is the best point. But in fact, coordinates have some structure built in, that of shift invariance. So you're always making some, uh, so introducing some inductive bias. And I think the, 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 the scientific question is how much to put in. And uh, I, I think different people land up on different places on this. I think what is problematic is when we put in inductive bias, which is wrong. And uh, so the, in the early days of speech recognition, there was a lot of sort of inductive bias from linguistics, which was put in, which was in fact wrong and throwing that inductive bias out and relying on large amounts of data worked well. So that's where there is this famous quote from the IBM group, uh, Jelinek, which is every time he fired a linguist, the performance of his system went up. So that's effectively an argument about removing certain kinds of inductive bias. But I think what some of those things that the linguists thought were true were not necessarily true. They were just heuristics. Whereas I have greater faith in Newton. <laughs> yeah, so th this dichotomy between uh, analytical modeling and empirical models is 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 not uh, is not a zero sum game. It's it's not you either have. Uh, a fully analytical model, or you have a purely empirical model based on uh, based on no analysis. So, roboticists uh, do like to ask, "Oh, why should we learn Newton's laws? Why should we learn F equals m a?" And that essentially misses the point. We're not going to learn F equals uh, m a. But where does F come from? Where does m come from? Where does a come from? How do you know these quantities? You interact with the physical world and you sense the physical world through imperfect uh, sensors. You're, you have observations of F and M and A. So you can have an internal model of physics based on Newton's laws, 
but you still interact with the world uh, through very empirical, uh, imperfect uh, mechanisms. And it is those that, uh, uh, that you should model empirically. Uh, there is no perfect analytical uh, model for your, uh, your sensors or for the most advanced actuators that are actually used uh, in, uh, in robotics, which all have very tricky delays and generally don't do what your empirical models uh, say, uh, say they do. Um, so you can have a hybrid model in which uh, you bring in priors uh, for aspects of the world that you can model well like uh, Newton's laws or basic geometry that, uh, uh, that we're very confident in. And you wrap these analytical, uh, analytical modules in a larger empirical model such that hopefully you can back propagate through everything and do uh, uh, the kind of nice gradient based optimization that, uh, that we like. Yeah, great answer. Anyone else wants to comment? So I think we are out of time. So we should finish by anyone who wants to give some last thoughts. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, cool. I was going to say, just doing like a, a little uh, uh, sort of riffing off of the, the, the last uh, question of to what degree we should use sort of uh, classical structured models versus purely data driven. Um, and another place where I've, I've sort of seen uh, uh, data-driven things perhaps went out is, is robustness. It's sort of interesting. It's almost like a, the flip side of Tender's argument of, all right, so classic geometry for structure for motion, you would make use of things like RANSAC to make sure we're resilient to errors and correspondence. But I still feel like one of the places where these classic methods fail in the sense of when they work, they work great, but when they fail, they can fail catastrophically. Um, and I've seen this sort of firsthand. So, you know, one, one fundamental part of navigation is mapping. So you sort of figure out where you localize, where you are within some geometric sense of what, what the world looks like, what you expect it to look like. And if you're in a place where you can't localize, then all of a sudden you don't know what you don't know what you should expect the world to look like. And if you sort of wire things up the right way, that can be catastrophic. Um, you don't sort of look in front of you where you expect things to be. Um, and so uh, this notion of kind of learning to degrade gracefully. Um, somehow I feel like that actually is a surprisingly um, that seems to bubble up from a lot of these data-driven systems, even though we might not exactly train them for, for doing this. We maybe still train them with sort of typical losses, but somehow they seem to make um, reasonable-ish mistakes. I think sort of pushing on that um, is also kind of a win that you can get from uh, doing more sort of organic data-driven things as opposed to just wiring stuff up manually. Okay, so you mean that they fail, but they, they won't fail maybe miserably. So you can learn to that even if they make mistakes, they should not like, completely fail. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, to me, that's another important angle. Cordelia is mentioning this as well, with sort of good uncertainty estimates. And if you really want to get to the 99.99%, just somehow uh, think about how should you fail, uh, instead of just saying that I don't want to fail. But uh. Okay, guys, thank you so much. So I think I can mention that we were, we had to, uh, over the day or over the session, we had about 2,000 people watching us. And, uh, so I hope they enjoyed. We cannot hear the applause, but I'm sure they, you would have lots and lots of applause if uh, you would be there. They would be there, and if we would be there. And I hope we all will be there soon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you for organizing. Of course, yes. For organizing. So, thank Bye. you for coming, all your efforts. Bye. Bye.